It goes without saying that the SCP Foundation archives are filled with some terrifying monsters. Even the deadliest creatures can, in theory, be defeated, or at least soundly avoided. After all, they're just flesh and blood, or in some cases, metal or concrete. But what if reality as you know it one day just broke? Or worse, you were transported to a reality so frightening and alien to our own that death seemed like the only escape. But you couldn't even give yourself that. This brings us to today's topic, the terrifying alternate reality of SCP-3001. The Foundation is no stranger to freaky alternate dimensions, but what was experienced by joint lead researcher Dr. Robert Scranton at Site 120 is a truly unique nightmare. Co-managed by his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, Site 120 is a facility largely designated for research into SCPs with dangerous reality warping capabilities in order to mitigate future containment breaches. Reality Warpers are among some of the more perplexing and dangerous SCPs, from the pocket dimension creating SCP-106 to the SCP creating Dr. Wondertainment and everything in between. Scranton and Lang's goal to further study such entities was an admirable one, if a little overambitious. And on January 2, 2000, during the testing of a new technology created by the Foundation's leading power couple, disaster finally struck. Scranton and Lang had already been the brains behind one of the Foundation's most valuable tools in the fight against reality-bending SCPs, the Scranton Reality Anchors. Their follow-up, the Lang Scranton Stabilizer, or LSS, likely would have been an even more advanced variant of their earlier invention and should have been a huge success for the team. But things didn't turn out that way. Dr. Scranton and several other researchers were gathered in Reality Lab A performing routine tests on the LSS prototypes. While other technicians ran diagnostics tests, Scranton stood at the control panel, the blinking red light above the console confirming that everything was going according to plan. But as anyone who's fallen victim to one of the Foundation's many anomalies will tell you, just because you've done everything correctly doesn't mean you're safe. Scranton began operating the machine, not knowing that something was rumbling up towards him from below. Without warning, a sudden, unexpected burst of seismic activity rocked the entire base. Researchers grabbed onto whatever was closest as the world shook around them. In his panic, Dr. Scranton clung to the LSS control panel as the seismic blast fried the circuits and kicked it into overdrive. There was a blast of magnificent blinding light, and when the rumbling stopped, not only was the doctor gone, he had been erased from reality as we know it. The earthquake had caused a deadly malfunction in the machine meant to stabilize reality and instead tore a rift in it dragging the unfortunate doctor and the control panel into oblivion. His wife, Dr. Lang, and the many researchers who idolized him were devastated by his unexpected demise at the hand of what should have been his crowning achievement. The one silver lining was that this reality-ripping event had almost definitely eliminated the doctor quickly and painlessly. As far as the Foundation and his loved ones were concerned, Scranton's death had been immediate and complete a luxury afforded to few Foundation employees who die anomalous deaths. But sadly, that isn't how Dr. Scranton's story, or the story of SCP-3001, ends. No, this is where it all begins. How do we know all this? In the hellish new place where Scranton had been transported, the control panel from the LSS that he'd been clinging to for dear life had been transported with him and continued to record audio data from this anomalous location. Not that Dr. Scranton realized it. Not at first, anyway. As far as he knew, he'd suddenly been transported into a pitch-black location. No sights, no sounds, no sense. True nothingness. At first, the doctor was confused. One second he was testing out his new technology, and the next he was quite literally nowhere. In spite of his current situation, the doctor was still an intelligent and rational man. He took a moment to compose himself, hoping that in time his eyes would adjust to the new darkness around him. But that moment never came. The darkness remained perfectly absolute. Much like the darkness in another reality-defying SCP, the deadly endless staircase known as SCP-087, the dark seemed thick, almost like you could touch it. The doctor, not wanting to give himself to despair and die in this impossible place, and with no other options seemingly available, began walking. Either he'd find his way out, or the Foundation would find him. No need to panic. It may have altered the Doctor's temperament if he knew that the Foundation already assumed he was dead, and that no search party was going to come looking for him. 
Still, logic dictates that if a person walks for long enough, they're bound to find something. The problem Scranton was about to face was that SCP-3001 doesn't run by any kind of conventional logic. He walked and walked and walked, but he didn't seem to get any nearer to or farther from anything. But how could he even know? After all, in total darkness, there aren't any landmarks to assist in navigation. The doctor walked and paced and screamed for days on end, but he made no progress. He was alone in an empty world. He had no choice, though. So he kept walking and walking and walking for 11 days. During that time, he felt his hunger and thirst grow. He was in terrible pain from a mix of starvation and dehydration, but the release of death didn't seem to come for him. He was going to have to learn the rules of this new place the hard way, and it grimly dawned on Dr. Scranton that dying in this place might not even be the worst possible outcome. He paced and repeated facts to himself, hoping to ground himself in the moment and avoid the panic that could so easily set in. Name, Robert Scranton. Age, 39. Birthday, September 19, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, Living on a Prayer. Wife, Anna. Little by little, the words seemed to turn to nonsense in his mouth as the terror grew. Just as he felt like he was about to lose his mind, he noticed something. A small oasis in the endless darkness of SCP-3001. The glowing red light on the LSS control panel. Where had it come from? And how was it still recording? The doctor had no idea, but he was grateful for any kind of familiarity in the strange darkness around him. Perhaps the LSS could be the key to saving him, or at least figuring out what on earth was going on here. Whatever the case, there was no denying that having the panel here was better than nothing. At least, when it was found, if it was ever found, then people would know what had happened to him. As the days passed and he continued to mysteriously survive, Dr. Scranton deduced that one didn't need food or water to survive continually in SCP-3001. The location had an anomalous effect on its inhabitants. As the days passed and turned to weeks of wandering in the darkness, Dr. Scranton further deduced that he was no longer in his home dimension. This was an entirely separate pocket dimension much like the one possessed by SCP-106, but featureless, a perfect self-contained void. Now dimly illuminated by the red light of the panel, Dr. Scranton explored further into the void around him. He traveled for months on end, the pain of his deficiencies growing by the day, but found he was getting nowhere. All things considered, he wasn't even sure he was moving, or whether reality and darkness were swirling around him like a thick liquid. Rather than walking on a single flat surface, he was moving in all directions across a three-dimensional plane. The space-time continuum appeared to be entirely broken here, where movement is more defined by the conscious intention to move than any real geographical repositioning. Dr. Scranton knew that this place broke every single one of Kijel's laws of reality parameters. And from his years working with a plethora of reality warpers in Site-120, he had a theory for why this pocket dimension was so strange. It had an extraordinarily weak Hume field. Before we get back to Dr. Scranton's semi-living nightmare, we need a quick primer on Hume theory and why having a weak Hume field is such a problem. A Hume is a unit of measurement for the strength and amount of reality in a given location or being. In an area with an incredibly low Hume field relative to our world, such as SCP-3001, universe breaches and anomalous incidents rise significantly. At the time of his being trapped there, SCP-3001 had the lowest number of Humes in any recorded environment, making it a phenomenally anomalous zone. It was for this reason that starvation and dehydration never took hold of him despite causing him great pain. And the worst by far was yet to come. Dr. Scranton wasn't trapped in this dimension for weeks or even months. He was trapped in the darkness for years, and it took a nightmarish toll on his body and mind. The small flashing red light on his LSS control panel became his only friend, and as the years drew on, he would hold entire conversations with his only source of illumination. He knew that his days were numbered. If he didn't escape the dimension within around three years, the Hume field would diffuse further, and he would be left in a truly horrific state. But based on how little headway he'd made in the time he'd been there, he didn't feel optimistic. He kept speaking into the recorder, if only to break the silence and prevent him from going completely insane. But even that would only hold it off for so long. Alone and talking to himself endlessly in the darkness, Dr. Scranton could feel his mind slipping as the confines of the pocket dimension constricted and his body began to change. 
the low Hume field slowly diffused his physical matter, destroying the physical integrity of his body, but never being merciful enough to actually let him die. In his haunting audio logs, the doctor described his hands as diffusing and thinning out like spiderwebs. Over time, there was less and less of him, and what was left wasn't entirely human. As Scranton's Hume level lowered to equalize with that of SCP-3001, the lines between his body and the LSS control console began to blur in a twisted marriage of warp flesh and machine. The Lang Scranton stabilizer was anything but stable. Before his mind and body became something else entirely, the doctor still had the presence of mind to finally realize how he'd come to be in this terrible place. The LSS had opened a wormhole known as a Class C broken entry into a paradoxical pocket dimension between layers of reality and taken him through it. He'd slipped through a crack in reality into absolute darkness, and now he was stuck with a fate far worse than death. How do we know any of this? Much like the event in the first place, it's a total accident. Testing superior reality-bending technology almost six years after the disappearance caused the sudden return of the missing LSS to Site-120's reality labs. The only trace of Dr. Scranton that it brought back with it was the blood and viscera that coated the console, much to the abject horror of his still-grieving wife, Dr. Anna Lang. To this day, Dr. Scranton, formerly one of the Foundation's brightest minds, remains trapped in the nightmare of SCP-3001. His current condition, whether the doctor is still alive after 20 years of being warped by the low Hume field of 3001's darkened confines, is still unknown. But for the doctor's own sake, we hope he's been dead for quite some time, because few things on Earth are as horrifying as the alternative. Mobile Task Force Edna 84, also known by the codename and thus upon his crucible, is on one of the strangest missions they've ever been sent on. They sit in a darkened room, beads of sweat trickling down their brows. The lights of computer monitors shine upon their faces. They're tackling a monster that, if it escapes, will literally devour all of creation. It has no fear. It has no remorse. And if it isn't kept contained by Edna 84, it may escape and wreak havoc across the world. Oh, and did we mention it's trapped in a Minecraft server? You heard us right. SCP-4335 is a cognitohazardous extra-dimensional being of pure terror, trapped inside a procedurally generated world in the immensely popular game Minecraft. You hear about a lot of horrifying monsters being described as Lovecraftian, but only this monster is Minecraftian. There's a lot that needs explaining here, and we intend to get to all of it, but let's start with how the Foundation keeps this truly exceptional beast contained. The Foundation first discovered SCP-4335 back in 2010, shortly after the alpha version of Minecraft was released. Because of the online nature of the game, it's proven to be impossible to contain 4335 externally, seeing as it isn't confined to any one physical location. Shutting off the server 4335 is found in is not an effective containment method either, as this just causes the entity to simply hop to a different server. The Foundation's greatest fear is that 4335 will one day make the leap out of Minecraft and cause chaos in our world. That's why it's imperative to draft containment procedures for SCP-4335 within the game. This led to the creation of a containment site unlike any other. Site M1, the first official Foundation site made entirely out of Minecraft blocks. Everyone who was originally involved in the server has been removed and amnestatized. Since then, elite SCP Foundation containment specialists and gamers have been constructing the perfect prison for SCP-4335. Site M1 is a large stone complex built into the side of a mountain. It has a number of key features, including a supply area filled with materials vital for 4335's continued containment, chests filled with books that contain SCP-4335's containment procedures, a few animal farms for the purpose of breeding and killing livestock for their meat, the entrance to a mine, several chests containing books specifically designed for civilians to learn about 4335, if they ever breach containment and enter the server, and of course, the actual containment chamber for SCP-4335 itself, which is a little more complicated. 4335's containment chamber is built out of several layers, all made from iron blocks. The outermost cube is 75 by 75 by 75 blocks, 
the inner cube is 55 by 55 by 55 blocks, and the innermost cube is 25 by 25 by 25 blocks, creating several levels of defense. Finally, one layer within all these others which contains the anomaly proper is made from obsidian blocks. SCP-4335 is bound into the center of the containment chamber with a complex mechanism. The outermost cube is completely filled with water, and several dispensers capable of rapidly dispensing large amounts of items in a short amount of time line the cube. The cube also contains several mob farms, which are devices that constantly spawn enemies into the chamber that drop loot when they die. The chamber is essentially designed to funnel a constant flow of items inwards to SCP-4335. There are even contingency measures for if SCP-4335 manages to breach containment. If escape is attempted, blocks of TNT detonate above the ceiling, causing lava to pour into the chamber. At that point, MTF Edna-84 are dispatched into the server to lure 4335 back into its containment chamber. To do this, they fire a mix of fire-resistant potions and ender pearls, which have teleportation capabilities. Interestingly, there's one more basic method of luring SCP-4335 back into the Obsidian Cube, taunting and insulting. One of SCP-4335's many anomalous abilities is being able to hear people through the screen, and being a proud creature. It often responds to insults by charging in to directly engage the insulter. If SCP-4335 still manages to breach the containment that has been set up for it, then they even expect that it will likely soon hop into another server. At that point, the goal will shift to finding the monster and recontaining it. With containment procedures this complex and extensive, it shouldn't come as a surprise that SCP-4335 rests firmly in the Keter class. What exactly is this anomalous entity? Why does its containment hinge on constantly providing it with items? And how did it end up in Mojang's popular building and survival game in the first place? SCP-4335, in terms of physical dimensions, appears almost identical to the player character, with an all-black skin. It also appears to be constantly shrouded in a cloud of smoke particles, and has long black tendrils protruding from its back. In some respects, 4335 has been compared to two popular creepypasta figures, Hero Brian and the Slenderman. But 4335 is far stranger. Its physical body behaves similarly to most assets native to the game, with a few peculiar, anomalous abilities we'll discuss soon. Handling SCP-4335 is an extremely delicate process. If command blocks, creative mode, or server commands are ever enabled in a server with SCP-4335, the server will instantly shut down, and SCP-4335 will move to a different server. SCP-4335 also uses its tendrils to destroy surrounding blocks before consuming them. With each successful consumption, SCP-4335 grows, and when it reaches sufficient size, it hops to a different server. As you can see, keeping SCP-4335 contained is an uphill battle, but luckily there are two factors on the Foundation's side here. The first is that SCP-4335 is immobilized while consuming items and blocks, limiting its ability to actively escape Foundation forces. The second factor is that SCP-4335 needs a rest period between consuming blocks in order to grow, meaning if its consumption is constant and continuous, it isn't able to grow. These two factors have informed the entirety of the Foundation's containment procedures around SCP-4335. It's locked into its chamber and fed items and blocks constantly, effectively rooting it in place. When SCP-4335 begins to grow, the Foundation also found that the application of Ender Pearls helps reduce it back to its normal size. However, SCP-4335 does have a method of striking back against its captors. 4335 is a virgin-class multisensory cognito hazard. Anyone viewing it without proper training and protection may experience distressing hallucinations. SCP-4335 is also capable of telepathic speech, with people playing on its server, and as we alluded to earlier, it can also hear any noises you make while playing. Weird is a term thrown around a lot when it comes to SCPs, considering it's pretty much a requirement for the Foundation to take interest in you. But an all-devouring Minecraft demon that can hear you talking through your screen is strange, 
even by Foundation standards. MTF Edna84 first discovered SCP-4335 in the single-player server of Minecraft user Leaking Heart. Three team members, Jason Yelsen, Richard Duchamp, and Shelia Freemason, covertly entered the game to investigate and potentially apprehend the creature. When Leaking Heart first discovered their presence on what he thought was a private server, he quickly left, a little creeped out by the sudden intrusion. Thankfully, the trio was still able to locate SCP-4335. They discovered the creature hiding inside a giant crater, as though it had impacted the Earth at considerable speed. Richard Duchamp, who was the leader of the team at the time, made the mistake of looking directly at the entity. In that moment, he experienced the full force of SCP-4335's cognitohazardous effects. He hallucinated, believing that his keyboard was melting before his eyes. In the aftermath of this incident, Duchamp was taken off the case, and Jason Yelsen was promoted to head of the project. Things were still going to get stranger. Yelsen was able to open a dialogue with the creature after containing it in a chamber filled with lava. It asked him whether it had landed in the right location, meaning our world, and Yelsen informed him that it had somehow fallen into the world of Minecraft instead. The creature was at first confused, and then angry and resentful about its situation. It vowed to find its way into our world somehow, and obtain more sustenance. A few months after this, the entity managed to breach containment and hop into another server. Yelson and two others once again managed to track it down and recontain it, but this time two civilians also inhabiting the server were exposed to the anomalous effects of SCP-4335. They weren't hurt, but they did appear strange and incoherent after experiencing 4335's cognito hazards. The Foundation tracked them down in the aftermath and gave them amnestic treatment. 4335 was contained shortly thereafter. Once again, Yelson came face to face with his new foe. Eight months after being captured, 4335 granted Yelson another interview from containment. 4335 admitted that it almost respected Yelson and the rest of the Foundation for figuring out how to capture and contain it so quickly. In exchange, it would give the Foundation something extremely valuable, information. First, it asked one question of Yelson. How does he define creation? Yelson replied, Uh, something that is built and brought into this universe by a sapient being using other things from this universe? 4335 agreed. It went on to explain that it came from a universe devoid of creation, a dark and unknowable place, filled with nothing but violent random chaos. Its dimension existed directly above ours, and it often looked down at us through a dimensional window, fascinated by all the creation below. It plotted and dreamed to one day infiltrate our reality, and Yelson finally had the opportunity to ask the magic question, why? Though he wasn't quite ready for the brutal honesty of SCP-4335's reply. I do not like to lie, so I will tell you now. I wish to suck it dry of the toys of whatever force controls your universe. Destroy the light, destroy the earth, and destroy humanity. It reminded me of me. A blubbering mass of intelligence and order. It sickens me in ways I cannot comprehend. I hope you understand. SCP-4335 was a connoisseur of creation, and it sought to devour all of it. In this moment, Yelson realized what an incredibly dangerous entity he was dealing with. The only mystery was why this creature had somehow landed in Minecraft instead of our world, which appeared to be the only thing that saved us. But Yelson didn't have time to think. 4335 was about to stage another daring escape attempt, one of its tendrils reached out and attacked Yelson's player character. In that moment, the real-life Yelson began to hallucinate and panic. Suddenly back in the game, a series of abnormally tall, slender black figures appeared and began deconstructing the containment chamber around SCP-4335. It had somehow summoned new minions into the game to assist in this containment breach. Jason Yelson entered Cognito Hazard Quarantine following this incident and was removed from the project. 
and he wasn't the only one affected by this incident. Following the first appearance of these long, dark figures, players across the globe began to experience them appearing in their own games. The Foundation managed to find a solution. They contacted Mojang and had the creatures patched into the game during the next update. As a new, non-anomalous entity, which seemed to stop 4335 from being able to use them as its own tools. They're now known as the Endermen, and are beloved among fans for being one of the creepier enemies. To this day, containment efforts continue for SCP-4335, but there's only one question mm -hmm. left. Why did the entity fall into Minecraft rather than our world? The file posits the most likely answer because 4335 defines creation as elements made by sapient beings. In Minecraft, the most popular game in the world at the height of 4335's power, everything that exists is the product of code made by humans. Creation is truly abundant there. As for our world, in SCP-4335's extra-dimensional eyes, there is no creation, no intelligent design, no soothing piano soundtrack, just frightening, chaotic randomness which is too unlike its own dimension. So even if SCP-4335 ever did arrive in our reality, it would likely be disappointed by how little there is to eat. Ah, oh, here we go again. It's time for us to take another crack at putting SCP-682 six feet under once and for all. If you've been following this channel for any amount of time, then there's one thing you know for certain. SCP-682 is harder to kill than pretty much, well, anything. We've made multiple videos on the Foundation's failed attempts to finally terminate the beast, and we've made a video with some of your ideas on how to finally slay the monster. And considering you're watching this video right now, you can probably guess how that went. Now it's time for one more run at the Death Star, and once again it's with your ideas from comments and community post responses. Let's see if any of them can help us finally put this ill-tempered reptile to rest. If we can't, well, we're not blaming you, but it's also your fault. Let the community termination attempts commence. Anas McBride suggested, Ask the Witch Child. SCP-239, also known as the Witch Child, is one of the most dangerous and powerful anomalies out there. She's a small girl with unparalleled reality-warping mental abilities, so powerful that her very brainwaves alone can be passively fatal. However, the problem is, her power is so potentially dangerous that she's forever kept in a kind of medically-induced anomalous coma. Dr. Alto Kleth thinks she's so dangerous he's even campaigning to have her terminated. As a result, the O5 Council has forbidden any cross-testing between 682 and 239. Fearing the consequence of 682 gaining 239's powers and becoming a truly unstoppable threat capable of causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Syed Zamin Ali Shah Kazimi Mushadi suggested, kill him with SCP-734. This is an interesting one. SCP-734, also known as the baby, is an anomaly that causes a painful degenerative disease that eventually disintegrates the entire body and kills the victim if they so much as come into contact with the baby or its fluids. However, based on cross-tests with other similar touch-it-and-die anomalies like SCP-409, the contagious crystal, we can probably guess how exactly this would go down. In all likelihood, the baby's anomalous effects would infect and destroy large portions of SCP-682's body. However, at this point, 682 would adapt to the threat and begin to reverse it and heal. Even worse, it's likely that 682 would steal the ability for a limited time and become deadly to the touch. Caden Griffin suggested, Why don't you use the Dragon Slayer to terminate 682? It has proved itself many times in fights with LSAs. SCP-5514 The Dragon Slayer is essentially a giant fighting robot designed to take down killer kaijus with its plethora of state-of-the-art anomalous weapons and defenses. However, we'd still argue that while it could definitely help in immobilizing 682 during a rampage, it doesn't have much of a chance of actually killing it. Let's look at SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, a supernatural warrior with a blade hotter than the sun, capable of cleaving atoms in half. Even he couldn't kill SCP-682. So, a robotic approximation with only a fraction of the Gate Guardian's power is probably not going to have any real chance of killing 682. I'm a Chuckster48 suggested, make it bite its tongue so hard that it just destroys itself. 
While we can certainly attest from personal experience that this really, really hurts, we worry that if ever 682 bit its own tongue really hard, it'd just drive it into a state of murderous rage. Though we do take a small piece of satisfaction in knowing its tongue would probably be in distress for a few minutes afterwards, it's unlikely to wipe out the beast once and for all. Lazy Roy suggested, how about we just put SCP-682 in 2317's cell? SCP-2317 is an old wooden door that functions as a portal into the domain of the planet-destroying monster known as the Devourer of Worlds, a being that many believe is associated with the Scarlet King and will inevitably escape and cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. While you may be thinking, perhaps it'll kill 682, it's more likely that it'll collaborate, seeing as they both want the same thing, namely, to kill everyone. If you let 682 in, chances are it'll come back through the door with the Devourer right on its tail. Then, it's all of our problems. Guest 123116 suggested, drop him in Russia so they can terminate him. The Foundation has technically already tried this. They dropped 682 into SCP-3930, a patch of literal non-existence in Russia that causes anything that goes inside of it to cease to exist. And afterwards, he was fine. So yeah, dropping him anywhere in Russia is probably just going to get a bunch of innocent Russian civilians killed. Meischer said, The Foundation shouldn't worry about how to kill him, but how to stop his ability to adapt. I would suggest typing SCP-682 no adaptability juice or something like that into SCP-294 and then kill him by any means, which should kill him forever. An interesting theory, but what if he simply adapts to SCP-682 no adaptability juice? Then we'd really all be in trouble. Mario TGP said, give him a Twitter account, he'll be cancelled instantly for his spicy opinions. SCP-682 would cancel Twitter itself for not having opinions that are spicy enough. Sorry, Jack. SCP-096, still sore about losing the battle, we assume, said, Let him fight the Queen of England. After all, she's immortal too. We definitely think it would be interesting to see SCP-682 go head-to-head -head with the Queen of England. Based on all the knighting she does, we know that she at least has a sword, though we don't know if that sword is as powerful as the one wielded by the Gate Guardian. But regardless of the outcome, the battle would definitely change history. Every history book would simply read, SCP-682 punched the Queen. Everything else would just be a footnote. Noah Cordero said, Use SCP-2935 to kill the lizard. As you can see in the video, he will die. SCP-2935, also known as O-Death, is probably one of the scariest and deadliest SCPs out there. It killed an entire alternate dimension, including an alternate SCP-682. The problem is, putting R-682 into 2935's alternate reality could lead to the destruction of our entire dimension. Why is that? Because if 682 was somehow able to return to our world from the world of 2935, it could bring the spirit of death itself back with it and kill us all in the process. Explorando con Beto 1 suggested, SCP-682 vs. Lady Dimitrisque While Resident Evil 8's Lady Dimitrisque has certainly captured all of our… hearts, we don't think she'll be bringing home the W on this one. Lady Dimitrisque has a powerful adaptive ability of her own, with a high resistance to damage, impressive regenerative abilities, and a number of offensive capabilities, from huge claws to a powerful dragon form. However, considering she wasn't able to defeat Ethan Winters, she probably wouldn't be able to defeat SCP-682 either. However, in her dragon form, SCP-682 may finally join the rest of us in developing a crush. Or is that being crushed? Anyway, moving on. Jonathan Peckany suggested, Just ask SCP-343 on how to destroy it, or even better, ask if he could destroy it. It's an idea so good that the Foundation actually tried it, and it went about as well as you can expect. When the SCP known as God entered the containment chamber, he couldn't even see 682 in there, as though the creature was somehow totally invisible to him. When God eventually got bored and left, they told him that he was in there to destroy 682. He simply replied, He's not one of mine, deal with him yourself. Interpret that how you will. 12 Escobar Blanca's Eddie Saul suggested they could send him to Area 37 for the sisters to experiment with. SCP-1765, The Sisters, are a trio of terrifyingly powerful reality warpers that have taken over Area 37 and spend their days tormenting everyone inside with their twisted experiments. 
Using them to try to terminate 682 leads to similar problems with using the Witch Child or the Devourer of Worlds. If they decide to team up rather than fighting, or the sisters take over 682, we'd all be effectively doomed. Kiroya suggested, would the ants from SCP-743 tear 682 apart? The Foundation actually tried this, getting 682 to consume chocolate from the SCP-743 fountain, incurring the wrath of its flesh-eating ants. However, 682 developed an adaptation that gave it a long, anteater-like tongue that it then used to consume the ants faster than they could consume it. And even worse, the chocolate seemed to enhance its regenerative abilities even more for several days afterwards. Ball 2222 suggested, write the name in the death note. Great idea! We'll put it into practice as soon as you can tell us SCP-682's real name. It may come as a surprise, but its parents didn't actually name it the hard-to-destroy reptile. Steven Vieri suggested, I thought that maybe we should put him in a giant blender, and then when he's in small pieces, put lava in the blender, so it will incinerate him, then put nuclear waste into the blender and repeat that until there is no more left of him. After the cooking whisks last time, we feel obliged to include at least one attempt to kill SCP-682 with oversized kitchen equipment in every video about him. However, this attempt would probably go about as well as the last one, we're afraid. Extreme physical trauma by conventional means, like burning and dismemberment, has never been successful in the past. And the Foundation is extremely hesitant to use anything radioactive on the beast, in case it adapts and adds deadly radiation to its own arsenal. Mr. Master IQ suggested, just take away his plot armor. You can pry SCP-682's plot armor from its cold, dead claws. And as we've already learned, making those claws cold and dead seems next to impossible. Moving on. JC3 suggested, Hmm, if anyone can't beat the Undying Lizard, why not Omni-Man? I mean, he did kill all the Guardians of the Globe, of course he can kill SCP-682. Omni-Man from the comic and TV series Invincible is undeniably a formidable opponent, given he's able to destroy superhero teams, cities, and even planets. However, one of the few enemies to give Omni-Man a genuine run for his money is a genetically enhanced kaiju known as Hail Mary. Given that first, 682 has taken on being stronger than Omni-Man, like the Gate Guardian, and lived, and second that Omni-Man has struggled with monsters before, chances are he probably couldn't permanently kill this one either. Heikani Havea suggested, kill SCP-053, then 682 will be sad and die. Wow, now that's cold-blooded. However, even if this did work, it's important for you to remember that it's impossible to actually kill SCP-053, also known as the child or the little girl. Part of her anomalous abilities is that anyone who attempts to kill her will themselves immediately die during the process, normally due to a heart attack. So this method would result in a pile of dead Foundation personnel and no progress. Jerry Zhang said, mush peanut butter on it. This would definitely work if 682 had some kind of severe peanut allergy. After all, anaphylactic shock is no laughing matter. However, in the far more likely event that this will have no effect on SCP-682, you will likely just die with your hands covered in peanut butter. Andrew Mills suggested, My idea? Have several xenomorphs, predators, and Daleks, yes, that's a Doctor Who reference, take 682 on. Once again, in all likelihood, this would have no effect. 682 has survived blades and lasers, the primary weapons of the Predators and Daleks, and spends the majority of its life immersed in powerful acid, so the Xenomorph would hold no surprises for it. Sadly, this three-way team-up would be no match for 682, and even if it did defeat him, whoever wins, we, um, well, you know how it goes. Mateo Huang suggested, maybe just destroy reality. This... This might be the thing that finally kills SCP-682, but considering it's already survived being thrown into pure nothingness in Russia, it may just result in it being one of the only survivors of a full destruction of reality. We, on the other hand, would all be killed, though in a sense we wouldn't have to deal with SCP-682 anymore. So maybe that's a type of winning? And finally, Blind Honor suggested, would Saitama be a good way to eliminate it? He is One Punch Man, after all. Of anyone we've covered in this series, Saitama from One Punch Man would probably be the most likely to kill SCP-682, especially if he was taking the battle seriously. After all, he has killed planet-destroying monsters before with barely any effort. The only real question is whether he could be bothered to come down to a Foundation containment site and fight it. 
Saitama hasn't been known to be a very motivated guy. But of course, like with anything, there's the risk that 682 would survive and gain his powers. Which would be bad. Awesome, but bad. It was July of 2004, and Bill Murray was enjoying the peak of an extremely successful career. Not only had the iconic actor starred in some of the most beloved comedies of the 20th century, including Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day, he'd voiced the main character of the recently released live-action Garfield movie. It'd been a financial success, but it was a critical flop. Not that this bothered Bill. He was happy with the performance. And the paycheck. What he wouldn't be quite as happy about was the horrifying encounter he was about to have with SCP-3166. On July 8th, Bill was enjoying a cold drink on the porch of his luxurious Beverly Hills home. The sky was beginning to darken as the sun set in the west. It was a blissful evening. His wife Jennifer was inside, watching TV. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary, until he noticed a quick flash of orange in the distance. It was almost too fast to register, this large orange shape darting past the corner of his eye. For a second, he entertained the thought that it might have been an escaped tiger, but it was gone too fast to really tell. Bill finished his drink and headed inside. He had enough for one night. The next morning, he got up to read the paper and found the Garfield movie getting slaughtered by the critics. One review stated, No one can accuse Garfield the movie of infidelity to its source. It faithfully conveys the banality of Jim Davis's cartoon. Another called it, A film without energy and without spirit. He put the paper down and ate his breakfast. A few blows to the ego were worth it for the paydays that came with big-budget family films. Just then, his wife came to him with a strange question. Were you walking around downstairs in the middle of the night? No, he hadn't. He'd been sleeping like a baby. Why did she ask? Well, Jennifer said, I heard some rustling downstairs last night. It sounded like something big. He hadn't heard anything, though, and told her it was probably just her imagination. He put it out of his mind and continued about his day. He decided he would keep his eyes peeled for that orange blur again, though. Bill didn't see anything peculiar the rest of the morning and went to a local cafe for lunch. He ordered a coffee and a cream cheese bagel, then made a quick trip to the bathroom while his food was prepared. When Bill returned to his table, though, there was something strange. Instead of a bagel, there was a large heaping of lasagna on the table. What was going on? This cafe didn't even serve lasagna. Bill knew something was terribly wrong. Things only got stranger when Bill came home to find a small tuft of orange fur snagged on the frame of his front door. And it wasn't synthetic fur like you'd see on plush toys or stuffed animals. No, this was real animal fur. Maybe someone was just goofing off or trying to play some weird prank on him. But it didn't feel like it. Deep down, Bill Murray knew that he was in grave danger. Whoever or whatever was behind this, it wanted to hurt him. That night, his worst fears were realized. Bill's wife had left town for the week, and he was headed to the kitchen in the middle of the night for a glass of water. When he saw something, a huge figure moving up against the glass door leading to his backyard. The thing was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with a bloated, fur-covered, misshapen body that was pressed up against the door. Its fur was bright, garish orange, a cartoon orange. Strangest of all, though, was the sound it was making. It sounded like it was purring. Bill backed away from the door and then ran back to his room to hide. The whole night he sat cowering as he heard scratching against the walls, like something was trying to get in. He was terrified and too scared to do anything, even move. Finally, as morning broke, the noises seemed to stop. Bill had to do something. He couldn't let this nightmare go on another night. What if things got worse? What if that thing managed to get inside? He called the local police and when they arrived, he explained the incredibly strange situation as best he could. He told them he was being stalked by some kind of huge cat, or at least someone dressed like a huge cat. Also, there was lasagna involved. The officers interviewing him could barely contain their laughter as he told them his story. A giant orange cat? Perhaps, one of them theorized. He angered some kind of obsessive Garfield fan through his involvement in the live-action movie. After all, the original comic had been running for years and had been extremely popular. Who knows what kind of nutjobs were obsessed with seeing only a faithful adaptation of the source material. 
As the officers departed, Bill was confident that they weren't taking him seriously. He couldn't rely on any of them for protection. Thankfully, from a multi-decade movie career, he had plenty of disposable income and decided to hire a private security team to protect him while he looked into this mystery. He had two trained bodyguards positioned around his home at all times for the next month. They were armed and given the cryptic orders to fire on anything orange. Meanwhile, Bill began to fall down a Garfield rabbit hole. He felt strangely compelled to research all the Garfield media he could find, as though the answer to his terrifying situation was somehow hidden between the lines. Bill explored the entire backlog of thousands of comic strips. He read the books and interviews with Jim Davis. He watched the cartoons and straight-to-DVD animated movies. Ironically for a guy who'd recently portrayed the lasagna-loving orange cat, Bill had never felt quite so immersed in the character before. He found the strange pathos in the routine of Garfield and his friends. One particular comic really piqued his interest, though. Originally published in October of 1989, the comic began with Garfield being woken up by a strange chill, an almost eerie sensation. The character observed aloud that he didn't feel like he was in his own home. He explored his little home further, trying to find his owner John or his housemaid and sometimes nemesis Odie, but found nothing. As Garfield remarked on feeling alone, a purple speech box delivered the sinister message. You have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. He then finds that his home looks like it's been abandoned for years. The for sale sign outside is practically ancient. Garfield slowly comes to a horrifying revelation. Everyone really is gone, and his adventures and friends now exist only in his imagination. He's trapped in a prison of his own creation, trying to stave off his endless loneliness in denial about the reality of his situation. The comic ended with a quote directly from Jim Davis himself saying, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. As he read those words, hmm. Bill Murray felt a chill down his spine. Why had he wanted to get involved in the Garfield movie in the first place? What had he gotten himself into? Before he could slip any deeper into his own mind, Bill heard a faint, choked scream downstairs. He felt his breath catch in his throat. He was terrified, but needed to see what was happening. He carefully and quietly began to creep down the stairs. At the bottom, he poked his head around a corner, and that's when he saw a member of his security detail lying dead on the floor. His face was blue from asphyxiation. His mouth was stuffed with lasagna. It looked like he had been force-fed to death. Bill wanted to scream, but he couldn't, or maybe knew he shouldn't. Just then, he heard a soft, meaty thumping noise coming from the nearby living room. He didn't know why, but he felt compelled to approach, as if by forces beyond his control. He made his way to the living room, and when he'd got there, he saw where the noise was coming from. Bill's jaw dropped in pure horror. There was the other member of his security detail, lying limp and lifeless under a giant orange figure. It was a grotesquely huge creature, wearing what looked to be a kind of crude Garfield outfit made of sewn-together cat pelts. It stank of pasta and rotten meat. In its giant paw, it held a golden trophy, which it was using to pound the security guard's head into mush, while making quiet, cat-like purring noises. The creature suddenly stopped and looked up locking eyes with Bill. The fear of death came over him. He froze as the giant freakish Garfield stepped over Donnie's corpse and began to come towards him. Bill turned and ran, but Garfield was gaining on him. Before he could make it to the front door, the creature knocked him over. He was laid out on the ground, looking up at it as it reached into its own body cavity and began to pull out handfuls of lasagna. He was about to shove a wad of the horrible decaying pasta into Bill's mouth when suddenly a ding was heard and the creature stopped. It looked up as if sniffing the air and then suddenly turned and lumbered towards the kitchen. Bill watched as the Garfield monster entered the kitchen where somehow there was a steaming hot fresh lasagna sitting in the open oven. The creature had sensed the presence of external lasagna and felt the compulsion to integrate it into its body grabbing fistfuls and shoving it into itself. 
Just then, a group of highly trained SCP Foundation personnel burst into the room and subdued the creature. It had been an ambush. The Foundation had been tipped off to the presence of the creature by monitoring the local police department dispatches, and the report of a seven-foot-tall comic book cat terrorizing a Hollywood actor was definitely worth looking into. The monster that had almost taken Bill Murray's life was SCP-3166, a deadly pataphysical being that tends to manifest around people somehow involved in the Garfield intellectual property. It appears whenever the public perception of Garfield falls out of favor, and because Bill had starred in the critically panned Garfield movie, he was currently at the very top of SCP-3166's hit list. Thankfully, he managed to survive his terrifying ordeal, and was administered amnestics by Foundation personnel so that he could return to his normal life. This frightening and mysterious creature has been around since 1989, appearing after the publication of the haunting Garfield comic that Bill had read that very night. It appeared in the office of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time, and began wrecking havoc. Since then, the creature's manifestation has been a constant threat whenever Garfield loses its popularity or audience. As a result, the Foundation has spent years as the funding source behind all Garfield media, and even planting hypnotic mimetics into the comic strips to ensure that there is always a loyal fan base. The fur is indeed real, organic cat fur, albeit an unnaturally orange color. And instead of organs, the creature is filled with lasagna. Worst of all, though, is that testing has revealed that the meat in the lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield's creator, Jim Davis. How did this thing come into existence? Perhaps it was Jim's sheer force of imagination that dragged it into being. As he himself said, an imagination is a powerful tool. All in all, it's lucky that Bill Murray was able to survive his encounter and return to his normal life. Well, as normal as life can be for Bill Murray. And if you see Bill Murray, don't bother asking him about SCP-3166. The amnestics were quite effective, and just as he's fond of saying himself, no one will ever believe you. Jay and Michael were a pair of urban exploration YouTubers looking for their big break. You might remember their video exploring the dead mall on the outskirts of your town, or the supposedly haunted 1950s insane asylum out in the sticks. But you certainly won't find these videos anywhere online. After the incident at SCP-823, all of their content was scrubbed away from even the most comprehensive internet archives. Why? you ask, because these unfortunate urban explorers decided that their big break would be exploring a certain abandoned theme park, and it would be one of the last decisions they ever made. Michael and Jay had heard rumors about the theme park. Its name was lost to time, as was the date of its opening and closing, and the reason it was even abandoned in the first place. Even some of the most hardcore urban explorers didn't dare to tread there. Something about it, a good friend had once told Jay, just didn't feel right. Sometimes if you dare to venture into the forest near the theme park at night, you can still hear music. The jolly, piping tunes of rides and carnival stands still beckoning, as if to say, we're still here, come and play. Of course, none of this frightened Jay and Michael. They could already smell the sponsorships from headlamp and compact camera companies. No amount of anxiety would stop them from making their doomed trip to the so-called Carnival of Horrors. It's a terrible shame. If they'd listened to the stories of this place about how unnatural and evil it could be, they might still be alive today. Like all the best urban explorers, they arrived at the woods near the abandoned theme park in the dead of night. They ignored the signs warning them about everything from structural instability, to dangerous wild animals, to asbestos. Nothing would keep them out. Nothing. They reached the abandoned theme park not long after, though it was a mere shell of its former self. During the several decades of abandonment, nature had reclaimed it. The ferris wheel was covered in overgrown ivy, and the carnival stands were blanketed with mold. As the duo swept through the grounds with their flashlights and cameras, they saw a faded sign that bore the words, Thriller Chiller, the park's most popular roller coaster. They also took their time to marvel at the exceptionally creepy-looking Tunnel of Love, the broken-down House of Mirrors, and a huge, grinning statue of the park's former mascot, Happy Hippo. This theme park was something out of a nightmare, 
which naturally made it potential video gold. But as the excited duo wandered further into the park, they couldn't help but notice the quiet, tinny carnival music. Music that seemed to be drawing them closer. Michael asked Jay if he could hear the strange, impossible music, and felt a chill creep in when he answered that he did. Could all of the stories be true? They were lost in thought, but their legs kept moving. They were getting closer to something now. They could feel a presence. And was that music getting louder? An instant later, though, another sound cut through the silence. Bang! Bang! It echoed out through the still night air. Birds flew from their perches in the trees. Jay and Michael both fell to the ground dead, their heads taken off by the 50 caliber rounds of a highly trained mobile task force sniper on the payroll of the SCP Foundation. Their recording equipment, along with their bodies, were taken and destroyed. Any trace of them were scrubbed from the internet. It may seem a little harsh, but a bullet to the head is much kinder fate than what would have awaited these two if they'd kept walking. That's because the Carnival of Horrors is no dark fairy tale. The rumors are all true, and something really is waiting in the dark. That's why this abandoned theme park is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-823, a Euclid-class anomaly with a violent history. What's even more unnerving is that the researchers studying 823 have repeatedly implored the O5 Council to increase the park's classification to Ketir and allocate more resources for containment, only to be denied. But after you've heard about the horrors that unfolded there and the danger it poses, you'll probably take the researchers' side. The park is divided into two zones, the Yellow Zone and the Red Zone. There are to be at least six members of Foundation personnel present in the Yellow Zone at all times to ensure that no civilians wander in. Our two urban explorers earn themselves a death sentence not just by wandering into the Yellow Zone, but passing dangerously close to the Red Zone. This is the true epicenter of the park's dangerous, anomalous activity. It's a place so hazardous that anyone entering, whether they're a civilian or a member of Foundation staff, is to be executed at a distance by sniper fire without hesitation. Once upon a time, though nobody knows exactly when, there was a theme park that seemed no different to any other. Eager children and thrill-seeking teens arrived by the busload, ready to stuff their faces with cotton candy and corn dogs, and then reverse the process on a vast array of roller coasters. But even then, during these good times, there was something dark lurking behind the cheerful facade. Little by little, everyone, visitors and employees alike, started falling victim to strange and horrific accidents around the park. Of course, when it comes to theme parks, accidents come with the territory, but none like this. Here are just a handful of the horrific and mysterious deaths that occurred while the park was open. So strap in, because just like a roller coaster, this isn't for the faint of heart. A pair of young lovebirds decided they wanted to enjoy the romance of the Tunnel of Love. The two sat in a swan-shaped boat as they were ferried through darkened passageways. Anyone would assume that they were having a great time, but at some point, terrible shrieks of pain and fear began to echo through the ride. Attendants, confused and terrified, stopped the ride and found that the screaming persisted. Just some stupid teens playing a prank, they figured and started the ride again. But when the swan-shaped boat finally exited the Tunnel of Love, the park employees were greeted to a horrifying sight. The two teens dead, their bodies somehow fused together at multiple points. Another unlucky customer met a gruesome fate inside the House of Mirrors. They entered, but while inside, they were stalked by a mysterious, carnivorous humanoid entity known as Subject 79. The customer was pursued and eventually caught by Subject 79 and brutally dismembered. Some parts of the body were fused to the House of Mirrors interior, while others, like the right arm, were never found. The customer actually survived their ordeal, and whether that's a happy ending is up to you. But it wasn't just the customers at the park who were in danger. A 23-year-old park employee working a summer job collapsed while entertaining children dressed as the park's cheerful mascot, Happy Hippo. It wasn't uncommon for people to get overheated and collapse in the heavy suits on hot days. But one thing was different here. He was screaming, crying, and trying desperately to remove his mask. People rushed to help, but nobody could get the suit off, and he was declared dead soon after. When he was eventually cut out of the suit, coroners found that the employee had choked to death. 
His mouth, trachea, and lungs were filled with a fibrous substance later determined to be identical to the stuffing of his costume. An intense roller coaster known as the Thriller Chiller was a magnet for horrific accidents, which became more violent and intense over time. The first accident seemed like a typical theme park tragedy. A safety harness failed, dropping a rider 15 feet during an inverted loop. They landed on the track below, breaking their neck and skull, causing instant death. While this was a tragedy, it wasn't exactly anomalous. But the next major accident on the ride was an entirely different story. This time, 15 people met with disaster while riding the Thriller Chiller roller coaster. Starting from the front and moving back one car at a time, each group of riders was decapitated by blunt force trauma. A new pair of decapitations appeared to happen at every turn and loop on the ride. Forensic scientists still have no idea how this could have possibly occurred. Despite all of these disasters, the park was only finally abandoned after a day known as Bloody Sunday, when the anomalous powers of the location reached a 20-year peak. It's believed that 231 people were killed during the carnage of that day, and another seven were horribly maimed. The SCP Foundation contained the Carnival of Horrors not long after, but the mysterious deaths didn't even end there. Foundation Mobile Task Force Row 71, also known as the Origami Toads, were sent in to assess containment procedures and discover the source of all the anomalous deaths. They were unsuccessful, though, and instead they merely added to the list in exceptionally horrifying ways. One agent was found dead, surrounded by empty grenades and bullet casings. It appeared he'd removed the explosive propellant from all of his ballistics and consumed it, dying in the process. Another was found with his jaw broken, having apparently pulled out and inhaled his own teeth, and dying of the resulting internal damage. The commander got the worst fate of all, so horrifying, in fact that we can't tell you the full details. All you need to know is that something was shoved into his brain that really didn't belong there. The Foundation considered having the entire park destroyed with a massive airstrike, courtesy of the Mobile Task Force New 7, aka Hammerdown. However, the O5 Council denied this request, on the basis that the park was too close to populated land. They'd have no plausible cover story for the bombing, and they don't even really know if blowing up the park would prevent anomalous activity from occurring. The Carnival of Horrors is here to stay, folks. The Foundation just hopes to keep it from getting new visitors. So then back to why the researchers want this place upgraded to Ketir. After all, these classifications aren't about how dangerous an anomaly is. They're about how difficult and complicated they are to contain. But here's the problem. According to the researchers, the Red Zone, where the dangerous anomalous activity is at its peak, isn't bound to one fixed position. It's changed position at least three times already, and even worse, it appears to be growing. Not seemingly so Euclid class now, is it? After all, you might not even need to visit the Carnival of Horrors to be in grave danger. If it keeps growing, then someday soon, the Carnival of Horrors may be visiting you. Every neighborhood has a house like it. You can probably picture it. That old, decrepit building on the very end of the street. It was there when you moved in, and it'll still be there when you move out. All sorts of salacious rumors spread about houses like this. It's a drug lab. It's a hideout for fugitives. It's haunted. But these are all just stories, right? Some of these houses contain real nightmares, though. Nightmares like SCP-136. There's a grain of truth in every story, and even lies can reveal certain facts about their tellers. That's why the SCP Foundation takes reports of so-called neighborhood haunted houses seriously, and performs regular checks on such buildings to see if any of them are actually the real deal. Children can have wild imaginations, but when children living on the same street, years apart with no reason to have been in contact with one another, all start reporting an eerily similar apparition in that creepy old house, and when the stories go beyond just getting freaked out and delve into truly life-altering traumatic paralytic terror, then the Foundation really can't afford not to look into it. One otherwise quiet morning, in a sleepy American town, a convoy of fumigation and asbestos removal trucks pulled in, surrounding that creepy old house at the end of the street. Residents were probably thinking, it's about time someone tore that old death trap down as people in protective suits spilled into the building. 
These were, of course, foundation field agents who would perform a routine sweep around every room and fully catalog the place. It looked like a pretty typical abandoned house, peeling wallpaper, dusty rotten furniture, all the trash and rubble that seems to appear in the absence of human life. The full sweep took little more than an hour, but towards the end of the observation period, Agent Sims, a field agent posted in the former child's bedroom, began acting strangely. He posed a question over the team's shared radio frequency. Hey, can anyone else hear that laughter? Confused, the other people on the team responded that no, they could not hear any laughter. A few other agents came to check on the room, but they didn't hear any laughter in there either. Even though Agent Sims appeared visibly uncomfortable, there was no identifiable source for this discomfort. The other agents left him so they could continue investigating the rest of the house. Other than one agent's fraying nerves, there didn't appear to actually be anything anomalous about the house. Then Agent Sims screamed and jumped out of the second story window of the house, sailing down towards the ground and fracturing his spine on impact. What could have made him do that? We're talking about an SCP Foundation field agent here, a highly trained individual handpicked by the Foundation to observe and track terrifying and potentially deadly anomalies out in the field. What could he possibly have seen in that decrepit old house that would lead him to believe leaping to his death was a preferable alternative to facing it? This was a question that the Foundation absolutely had to get an answer to. They intensified their search on the child's bedroom as the body of Agent Sims was carted away. That's when they found the object that they would later deem as SCP-136-1, a little rag doll made of old cloth. The kind of thing you could easily imagine getting carted around by some ragamuffin child at the turn of the last century. This was the only object of interest in the entire room, so it was tagged, bagged, and taken back to the nearest Foundation containment facility for further testing. They had no idea what they were about to unleash. When the doll was first brought into its containment chamber, one particular scientist on the research team, Dr. Myers, a headstrong young researcher freshly farmed from a prestigious university, took a morbid interest in the doll. Something about it, even in the absence of readily apparent anomalous effects, made her feel oddly uncomfortable. The doll seemed to carry a vague aura of doom. Was this what made Agent Sims act the way he had, or was this only the beginning? A D-Class was brought in for the first wave of testing. The unfortunate former arsonist was forced to simply stand around in the room with a doll and wait until something interesting happened, and for 20 minutes, no anomalous activity was reported. Then the D-Class began frantically looking around the room, like a frightened animal. Dr. Myers, who had been observing the test, radioed in and asked what was happening. It's this laughter, this weird freaky laughter, like some crazy lady is in here. I can't see her though. Can any of you see her? Can any of you hear that? They couldn't see or hear anything. According to all of their monitors, it was just a lonely D-Class standing around in an otherwise empty room with nothing but a rag doll. Five minutes after the D-Class reported hearing the eerie laughter, he collapsed to the ground, shrieking like a maniac and crawling away from something he could not see. He was emitting the desperate screams of a man who truly believed something was about to take his life, but nothing was there. He backed into the corner of the room, gibbering incoherently and scratching desperately at the wall until his fingernails were ripping off, leaving bloody traces behind. In the end, a pair of guards entered the chamber and had to drag him out. The D-Class had urinated in fear and seemed to have temporarily lost the use of his legs from sheer panic. He was out of commission for several hours afterwards, breaking into on and off screaming fits whenever someone approached him. Upon reviewing the footage of the experiment, Dr. Myers noticed something strange. The moment that the D-Class had begun screaming, the doll had disappeared from the room. It only rematerialized in its previous position when the D-Class was finally dragged from the room. Eventually, the D-Class became lucid enough to be properly interviewed about his experience. He said that after first hearing the laughter, a sense of overpowering dread had begun building within him. Five minutes later, that was when the entity, later dubbed SCP-136-2, first appeared. The vision that appeared to him could generously be described as human, but it was a little too tall to really qualify. The monster appeared to be female, but like a freakish Carnival House of Mirrors exaggeration of what one thinks of being female. Long, flowing hair, large breasts, and a Barbie doll thin waist. 
She looked like the nightmarish doodle of a hormonal teen boy come to life, with a face twisted into a rictus grim somewhere between arousal and agony, showing way too many teeth. The creature was nude and posed provocatively, but it was anything but appealing. The D-Class reported that just seeing it was the most frightening experience of his life. And then, it started moving. It was slowly floating through the air towards him like a vengeful ghost, that painful smile getting wider as it drew closer to him. The D-Class could only describe the whole experience as feeling like death itself was coming towards him. When the creature was finally looming over him as he cowered in the corner, it opened its tooth-lined jaws and let out a long, piercing shriek before disappearing. In the following weeks, the D-Class was kept for testing. He experienced severe night terrors every single night afterwards, all of them related to SCP-136. Further tests looked into the doll itself, but there didn't seem to be anything anomalous about its construction. It appeared to be made from the kind of plain, non-anomalous materials you'd expect from any doll of this variety. Though, occasionally, the exact materials would change, even between observers. In addition to the most common cloth variety, witnesses have reported the doll being made of clay, wood, and metal, with 10% viewing the doll as male, with the rest all agreeing that the doll is female. The Foundation conducted a battery of tests on the doll, just to make sure that the results were largely consistent across all subjects. Over 25 subjects were tested on SCP-136, all reporting roughly the same results. Laughter after 20 minutes of observation, a few minutes of silence, and then, according to subject testimonials, the appearance of the same grinning, naked apparition, inducing a state of truly primal terror in its victims. Interestingly, not all of the subjects were D-classes. Some were volunteering scientists who were aware of the potential effects, but let their morbid curiosity get the better of them, thinking they would be prepared to face whatever terrifying vision would manifest from the doll. But in every case, they were reduced to the same screaming, traumatized Rex. But when a Foundation researcher named Dr. Simon, the 25th subject of the SCP-136 experiments, volunteered for testing, things took an even more horrifying turn. During the testing period, Dr. Simon had the unusual experience of not actually seeing the SCP-136-2 entity. After being told how terrifying it was by co-workers, he was a little disappointed that he didn't get to share their fears. Later that day, he went to get himself a warm cup of coffee from the science employee break room. His co-workers became concerned when his coffee mug dropped to the ground and shattered, as Dr. Simon pointed into a nearby empty hallway and began screaming. He claimed that he could see her floating down the hallway towards him, her face twisted into that menacing grin. As none of the other scientists could see what Simon was seeing, they surrounded him and attempted to calm him, assuming that he was perhaps the victim of some kind of sudden psychotic break. But minutes later, every scientist in the break room collapsed and fell unconscious. Not long after, they all began to wake up, except Dr. Simon. He had fallen into a coma and died while still on life support three days later. It was the first report of SCP-136 causing a death since Agent Sims' unfortunate fall. Dr. Myers immediately requested that SCP-136 be reclassified from Euclid to Keter class, so more resources could be allotted for its containment. Administration denied any changes to the containment procedures of SCP-136, frustrating Dr. Myers. But little did she know that it was because site administration had ulterior motives for SCP-136. No matter who they were, whether they were the hardened killers of D-Class, the trained soldiers of the Foundation Field Agent Corps, or jaded scientists who had seen any number of horrors each week as part of their normal jobs, SCP-136 had the unique ability to reduce its victims to terrifying wrecks. In a move that feels decidedly more in line with the Chaos Insurgency, Site Administration had started using SCP-136 to assist in enhanced interrogation with detained people of interest. Even the toughest nuts to crack soon became very talkative after the appearance of SCP-136-2 traumatized them for life. Essentially, the administrators were making a kind of deal with the devil, allowing SCP-136 more free reign, in exchange for them gathering valuable intel from these victims. But as always, the problem with making deals with the devil is that the devil is always going to collect his due in the end. Dr. Meyer's warnings would continue to fall upon deaf ears, though, even as the creature's power seemed to grow. 
Tests on D-Class continued, with the entity traumatizing a whole group at once during one of these experiments. However, when Dr. Myers herself, along with a few agents, entered the testing chamber to drag out their twitching bodies, they all fell unconscious. When Dr. Myers woke back up, three of the D-Classes had fallen into comas like Dr. Simon and died shortly after. Dr. Myers pleaded with the administration to terminate the doll, but her requests were denied. It was proving to be too valuable in its various interrogations. And besides, nobody was sure if the doll could even be terminated. Whenever it was damaged, it simply disappeared and reappeared within a one meter radius. The only thing that hadn't been tried was full vaporization, which Dr. Myers' superiors refused to sign off on. SCP-136 was here to stay. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for Dr. Myers herself. After one more unfortunate testing incident, where D-Class disappeared entirely in what seemed to be clear evidence of SCP-136's growing power, Dr. Myers implored site administration to reclassify the anomaly and slate it for termination. It was getting more powerful, more unstable, and more dangerous. But rather than terminate the anomalous ragdoll, in the end, all they did was remove Dr. Myers from the SCP-136 case. With her gone, there was one less thing for them to worry about as they gave more and more victims to SCP-136. Using its dark powers to torture detained people of interest into telling them everything they wanted to know. But with the entity seeming to grow more powerful with every victim, it seems very likely that Dr. Myers' worst fears will come true. And one day, those controlling the terrifying anomaly will find that they're the ones hearing a strange, evil laughter coming from nowhere at all. On a cold October night in 2003, Shirley Yates of Seattle, Washington was just about to get ready for bed when she heard a knock at the door. She approached the door and asked the person on the other side to identify themselves. The voice outside responded immediately. It was a salesman who just wanted a few moments of Mrs. Yates' time. This was odd for two reasons. First, it was almost 10 o'clock at night, much later than is usual for door-to-door -door salesmen. And second, the knock hadn't come from Mrs. Yates's front door. It was coming from the door to her bathroom. Has your home ever been visited by a door-to-door -door salesman? If you were born in the last 40 years, then your answer to that question is probably no. In the age of online shopping, the idea of a salesperson going from house to house hawking vacuum cleaners or encyclopedia sets feels like a relic from the past. It's highly unlikely you'd ever see one walking the streets nowadays, and equally unlikely that one would knock on your front door. However, if you live in Washington State, you might need to be wary of a certain salesman who is still doing the rounds. SCP-1879, also known as the Indoor Salesman and the Doorman, is a phenomenon that manifests randomly in homes throughout Washington. Subjects will hear persistent knocking from the interior doors of their homes, and the affected door becomes classified as SCP-1879-1. The knocking doesn't stop until the door is opened, at which point the subject will be greeted by SCP-1879-2. A Caucasian man of indeterminate age standing around 170 centimeters tall. The man will claim to be a salesman and immediately try to pitch a bizarre product to the subject whose home he's just invaded. The SCP Foundation was first alerted to the existence of the indoor salesman when they had intercepted a 911 call coming from the home of Mrs. Shirley Yates. She had opened the door to her bathroom in an attempt to get the salesman to stop knocking, and once he was in her home, he refused to leave. According to Yates, he kept disappearing in and out of random doors in her house. Foundation Field Agent Rogers was equipped with a recording device and sent in to investigate the case with several other agents. When he arrived at the home, he found Mrs. Yates inconsolable. SCP-1879-2 was still rapidly talking at her, and strangely enough, the product he was holding and trying to sell to her was a Border Collie puppy. As soon as Agent Rogers entered the room, the man shifted his attention away from Mrs. Yates and towards him. He then started trying to sell the puppy to Agent Rogers. Agent Rogers did not want to purchase this puppy, but he found that the man spoke so quickly and urgently, he couldn't get a word in edgewise. The man was begging Rogers to take the puppy. 
practically shoving it in his face, saying that he didn't need any money, and that the only payment he needed would be some of your time. Rogers grew so annoyed at being talked over and interrupted that he ordered the other field agents to apprehend the indoor salesman. They did so, but as soon as the agents walked him out of the front door of the house, he disappeared without a trace. The agents remained in the area to monitor the situation. SCP-1879-2 manifested again in Mrs. Yates' home six hours later, still trying to trade the puppy for no money, just a little of her time. Twelve years, to be precise. After hours and hours of being worn down by this supernaturally pushy salesman, Yates relented and agreed to take the puppy, and immediately disappeared. The indoor salesman then disappeared himself through the closet door before he could be apprehended again. At a loss for what to do, the agents administered Class A amnestics to Mrs. Yates' family and left. The reason for her disappearance wasn't fully known until 12 years later in 2015, when she reappeared in the same spot she disappeared from, having no concept of how much time had passed. The puppy really had just cost her 12 years of her life. Stories like that of Shirley Yates have popped up all over the state in the years since, from Everett to Walla Walla and everywhere in between. Due to the random nature of SCP-1879 events and the way the indoor salesman can disappear instantly in and out of any door in a building, the SCP Foundation has been unable to capture him. The best they've been able to do is monitor 911 calls from across the state, listening for key words that might indicate another SCP-1879 infestation. When such an event is reported, the Foundation deploys Mobile Task Force Row 4, aka Shoe Salesman. This task force's entire purpose is to minimize the amount of harm the indoor salesman is able to cause by intercepting him before he can make a sale. This is a very important task, as evidenced by the story of Mrs. Yates, since while the products this salesman sells might be innocent, he doesn't accept payment in any normal currency. The price he asks for his products are always bizarre and often deadly. If all someone loses is 12 years of their life, they could be considered to be getting off easy. In one instance, the product being sold was a single red rose in exchange for the subject's heart. Once the deal was sealed, the subject dropped dead on the spot, with an autopsy revealing that his heart and circulatory system vanished from inside his body. In another, the indoor salesman offered 220 bananas and told the subject to simply give him some sugar. The subject agreed, and all candied goods in the home disappeared. In a third, the indoor salesman was trying to sell a thermonuclear warhead, the price of which was the subject's soul. The subject accepted, and at first nothing seemed to have happened. The Foundation confiscated the warhead and placed it into non-anomalous containment. Later that day, the subject went to listen to some music, only to find that two of her vinyl records had gone missing, Lady Soul and Almighty Fire, by world-famous soul singer Aretha Franklin. So. Even though he's incredibly invasive, annoying, and his transactions can be deadly, the indoor salesman still maintains a sense of humor. The fact that the Foundation can't capture the indoor salesman means that a lot of questions about him remain unanswered. The biggest by far is why he does what he does. In most SCP-1879 events, the indoor salesman seems frantic and desperate to make a sale. Often he will refer to having quotas and deadlines to meet, which implies some other unseen entity that he has to answer to. These questions remain unanswered, because all attempts to interrogate the indoor salesman have been unsuccessful. When he manifests in a location, it's impossible to get him to stray from his sales pitch, and he disappears as soon as he successfully sells his wares. However, there was one instance where, after an SCP-1879 event took place, Foundation agents were there to witness a rare interaction between the indoor salesman and his mysterious employers. Agent Rogers and the rest of the shoes salesmen were called out to a home in Spokane, where rapid knocking had begun to emanate from the bedroom door. Equipped with recording devices, Rogers was able to record the voice of the indoor salesman coming from inside the bedroom. In the recording, the salesman grumbled to himself about not being able to meet his quota by tomorrow, saying that if he didn't, he'd be stuck in this world for the next century. He started knocking again, yelling through the door that he knew they were home. He kept knocking until he was interrupted by the sound of a phone ringing. The indoor salesman was heard picking it up, 
and Rogers managed to record the conversation. The person calling was, apparently, the indoor salesman's boss, who was calling to complain about his performance. Only one side of the conversation was heard, but evidently the indoor salesman's boss wasn't too happy about receiving two Aretha Franklin albums as payment instead of an actual human soul. The indoor salesman apologized for the joke, then told his boss, It won't happen again. Please don't hurt it. I'll meet the quota this time, I swear. He hung up, grumbling to himself again, I better get to move up to Elise Accounting this time. I've paid my dues and then some. Rogers finally opened the door to the apparent disappointment of the indoor salesman, who was hoping to speak with the home's owner and was quite annoyed at having another one of his sales interrupted by MTF Row 4. Rogers tried to ask the indoor salesman who he'd just been speaking to on the phone, but as usual, the salesman started talking over him. Now see here, let's think logically, he said. You know I'm not going to tell you anything. I know you're not likely to buy what I'm selling. So let's just move on to greener pastures. I'm coming up close to a deadline, and I'm sure you're swamped with making sure good people don't lose their jobs, so I'll just be on my way and let you do that. Ciao! The indoor salesman tried to close the door, but Agent Rogers blocked it with his arm. He was tired of this SCP giving him the runaround, and he was going to keep the indoor salesman here if it was the last thing he did. He demanded the entity stay and be interviewed, and other members of the task force apprehended the salesman, making sure he couldn't leave the room. The indoor salesman, now held in place by several armed men, seemed to finally relent. He told Rogers, I'm busy, so I'll tell you what. I'm gonna give you something, no money out of your pocket, and we'll call it even. Sound good? Rogers, just wanting to get this whole thing over with, agreed to those terms. Three seconds later, every agent on the scene was dead and the indoor salesman was able to straighten his tie, pick up his briefcase, and walk through the door to the bathroom. When the bodies of Agent Rogers and the rest of the MTF Row 4 were examined by Foundation scientists, the cause of death was found to be, in every case, thousands of coins suddenly appearing in not only their pockets, but also inside their stomachs, lungs, and even under their skin. Later that day, the indoor salesman was reported at a home in the same neighborhood. He was seen trying to sell the house's owner, 80-year-old retiree Alan Johnson, a Glock 18 pistol in exchange for his attention. As he had done so many times before, the indoor salesman disappeared through another door before the Foundation was able to reach the scene. And when the SCP arrived, they found Mr. Johnson still alive, but now missing his brief frontal cortex the part of the brain that controls attention. It's likely that, because of the nature of the entity, SCP-1879 might be entirely impossible to contain. The Foundation might never find out anything more than what they already know about the indoor salesman, the way he's able to manifest behind closed doors, or the reason he has to keep filling quotas for an unseen boss who apparently doesn't have a very good sense of humor. So, if you're ever in Washington State, be careful who you open your doors to, especially if the knocking you hear is coming from inside your house. There is a dangerous creature that could be anywhere in the world, hiding in plain sight, casually walking through crowded streets filled with people. A monster that is nearly impossible to see, blending into its surroundings almost perfectly. Not invisible, but unnoticeable, almost completely undetectable. But then you spot a familiar outfit in a crowd. You now know where the creature is. But it goes both ways. Since the moment you find it, it knows where you are. There is now not a single place on the earth that you could hide where it wouldn't find you. And it won't ever stop looking. To the staff at the Foundation, this creature is known as SCP-4885. But you and I know him by a different name. You may have seen his face hundreds of times, or stared for hours at a page trying to catch a glimpse of him. To us, he's Waldo. While this might feel like a very long-winded and silly joke, maybe even a prank that has been inserted into the SCP archives, it is anything but. If you grew up any time after the late 1980s, then you will likely be familiar with the Where's Waldo books. But for the uninitiated, there are a series of puzzle books created by illustrator Martin Hanford. Each book in the Where's Waldo line contains multiple double-page spreads of colorful, crowded scenes. The goal is for readers to spot the ever-elusive titular character, Waldo, who is hidden among the mass of other characters. 
Waldo himself is easily recognized, thanks to a design that has become truly iconic over the years. He is always depicted as wearing a red and white striped shirt with a bobble hat and matching colors. Waldo also sports jeans, circular rimmed glasses, and sometimes a wooden walking stick. So with that important context out of the way up front, what exactly is SCP-4885? Is the character from these children's books somehow brought to life? Has the character of Waldo always been a malicious, malevolent entity too powerful to be contained within his own books? Well, not exactly. SCP-4885 only seems to resemble the famous children's book character. Whether or not he is the living manifestation of Waldo in the real world is both unclear and up for debate. Examining its outward appearance, SCP-4885 does share the humanoid shape and looks to be wearing the same recognizable clothing of Waldo. There are, however, two notable bodily dissimilarities between the Waldo on the page and the physical form of SCP-4885. For one, this Waldo appears to be much paler to the one found in the book series. More noticeably, however, is the fact despite wearing the same circular glasses, SCP-4885 seems to have no eyes. Should a person learn of SCP-4885's current location, Waldo will simultaneously gain an awareness of this person. Learning instantly of their victim's location, SCP-4885 will traverse any space necessary, tracking their target down to anywhere they might be in the world. The creature has displayed a number of space-altering abilities, including teleportation. SCP-4885 can also alter the state of his own matter, allowing Waldo to phase through solid surfaces. No obstacle can stop his advance. Not walls, not buildings, not even his victim's own body. When SCP-4885 finally reaches the person who has learned of his location, Waldo will then proceed to murder them in an exceptionally excruciating manner. Using his matter-changing abilities, he will teleport or phase himself inside his victim, pulling himself through their body and destroying their internal organs. After causing catastrophic bodily damage, SCP-4885 will then wrench their victim's jaw open, unhinging it with enough force to climb his way out of their mouth, leaving them dead, their body completely mangled. However, this isn't even the final stage of Waldo's attack. There is a strange byproduct left after a fatal encounter with SCP-4885, a yellow liquid that is produced as Waldo exits his victim's body. When this substance comes into contact with the deceased person's skin, it triggers a bizarre change. The liquid will cause their bodies to change after death, their skin becoming covered in symbols. On closer inspection, it becomes clear that these symbols are illustrations exactly like the ones found in the pages of Where's Waldo. These corpses, referred to by the Foundation as instances of SCP-4885-1, will then start to act in a similar manner to SCP-4885, and anyone who sees one or learns of its location will cause Waldo to come looking for them. The Where's Waldo scenes left on a deceased victim's skin cannot be washed off or otherwise removed, and the only way to undo an instance of SCP-4885-1 is to skin an infected body after death. However, this creates a whole new problem. If someone was to attempt this, in doing so they would know the location of one of Waldo's victims. This knowledge would mean that whomever was trying to skin one of these bodies would themselves become Waldo's next target, and would likely end up just another instance of SCP-4885-1. In other words, it would be an exercise in futility. Naturally, the nature of visibilities and attack patterns make it difficult for the SCP Foundation to contain Waldo. SCP-4885 cannot be harmed through the use of firearms or other common conventional weapons at the Foundation's disposal. You might be forgiven for thinking that making a handful of people aware of where to find Waldo at the same time would be a viable solution. After all, he cannot be in multiple places at once, so perhaps he'd be unable to kill these individuals simultaneously. However, SCP-4885 has shown to be able to cope with this approach, dispatching his victims one at a time transforming each in turn into Where's Waldo printed corpses before continuing to the next would-be victim. If the victim is nearby, Waldo will force himself into their mouth, 
passing through their body and destroying bones, organs, and even the spinal column. When his victim is further away, Waldo will phase through the nearest wall and attack them, teleporting into his target and then climbing out of their mouth. Waldo's location or that of his victim's bodies are considered info hazards. Simply being aware of this information will cause SCP-4885 to activate. As a result of this, the staff at the SCP Foundation are not even sure that Waldo is actually contained at all. In theory, SCP-4885 is being held at an undisclosed Foundation site within a non-designed containment chamber, since even a number on the door would tip off what's inside, triggering Waldo's abilities. But here's the clincher, because nobody can know for sure where Waldo is without him coming for them. Nobody at the Foundation actually knows where he's being contained, if he's even contained at all. It is worth noting that, if someone receives a vague, non-specific description of Waldo's whereabouts, that he will make no attempt to seek them out. If he is contained, and if he was to ever breach containment, then the SCP Foundation has an entire set of procedures in place to ensure that no one ever finds Waldo. First, 36 containment chambers identical to the one SCP-4885 is supposedly held in are connected to a self-driving vehicle. An expendable D-Class personnel member is placed into the vehicle and a random number generator will select a number from 1 to 36. The self-driving vehicle will then arrive at the containment chamber chosen at random and the D-Class placed inside. Within each chamber are digital monitors, and once the D-Class is inside the chamber, all of these monitors will display the current location of SCP-4885. The Foundation has kept a GPS tracking device implanted within Waldo, but this information is normally kept secret to avoid any containment breaches. The D-Class essentially acts as bait for Waldo, forcibly given the knowledge of his location so that SCP-4885 will consider them a target. As part of the next phase of containment, Foundation staff will wait, giving Waldo enough time to arrive in the containment chamber and dispatch the D-Class within. After this, all of the 36 containment chambers are transported to random Foundation sites in disguised trucks so that no one is sure where SCP-4885 ends up. Every time SCP-4885 breaches containment, the entire procedure has to be repeated. The Foundation first encountered SCP-4885 a number of years ago inside a small wooden house, the exact location of which has since been expunged from all the SCP Foundation's records. While on assignment to secure an entirely different anomaly, the Foundation's Mobile Task Force Chai-19, also codenamed Unrelenting Punishment, were the first to discover Waldo. The three-person unit consisted of Foundation operatives named Amelia Merrick, James Klein, and Kurt Stoll. The trio cautiously entered the wooden house where they were meant to investigate reports of an anomalous inanimate object, a pair of black spectacles. According to initial intelligence gathered by the SCP Foundation, these glasses were capable of killing anyone that tried to wear them, leaving their body covered in pictures like those found in the children's book. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It is unknown if these black spectacles are the same eyewear worn by SCP-4885, but it doesn't seem like too far of a leap to assume that this may well have been the case. Searching the ground floor, the team had found no sign of the object they had been sent to recover. As Amelia, Kurt, and James made their way upstairs, something began making scraping sounds beneath them, but none of them noticed. In an abandoned bedroom on the upstairs floor of the house, Kurt spotted a drawing on the wall, which looked to have been made using crayons. He took a photo of the illustration, and this image is still kept in the Foundation's database. It appears to be a child's drawing, depicting SCP-4885 wearing his signature striped shirt and hat with empty, vacant eyes. Next to it was scrawled one simple phrase, Waldo found mommy. Continuing their way through the house, the team located the glasses they were looking for in an upstairs bathroom. However, as James bagged up the spectacles, ready for transport back to the Foundation, Kurt spotted another inscription on a nearby wall, one that the team were certain hadn't been there when they had arrived. James stepped in to translate using the Foundation's standard issue translation device. The phrase on the wall read, The basement. The corpses from a child's book are in the basement. He is there too. Fr and we're sure that you can already guess what happened after that. Immediately after reading these words, James began to groan and clutched at his stomach, showing signs of extreme pain. 
before Amelia or Kurt had any chance to figure out what was happening to their squad mate. Fingers began protruding from James's mouth. They gripped his jaw and pulled it apart with enough force to send his jawbone flying across the room. SCP-4885 climbed its way out of James's body, and Amelia and Kurt both opened fire on the creature. Waldo did not react, seemingly unfazed by the gunfire and sustaining no damage as he approached Amelia, who would be his next victim. Shoving his fingers into her throat, Waldo wrenched apart Amelia's jaw, breaking it before he clawed his way into her mouth. As he watched in horror, Kurt made a panicked call for help to the Foundation, but it was too late. Waldo had already dispatched both James and Amelia, and now Kurt was about to pay the same terrible price. Ever since this incident, the Foundation believes that they have SCP-4885 contained. When his file was created, their researchers created an automated algorithm designed to wipe away any mention of SCP-4885's current location or the house he was discovered in from Foundation records. With SCP-4885 now assumed to be contained, that only leaves one question. The same burning inquiry that's been plaguing man for decades. Where's Waldo? In this case, maybe it's safer if you didn't know. Growing up in a small Virginia town near the mountains right on the border of West Virginia, Zane heard all kinds of stories from his grandmother. Tales of mountain lions who could transform into ghostly women. The Tailypo, a fluffy rodent-like creature on an endless quest to get its tail back from the hunter who took it. The Mothman that appeared with glowing red eyes to warn of impending tragedy. Most of all, she warned him about the deer. Sometimes, she used to say, when you're out in the woods late at night, you'll see a deer acting a little bit funny. Maybe it's making strange sounds. Maybe it's standing up like a man. Maybe it's staring at you from the shadows and won't look away. If you ever see one of these deer, promise me you'll get away from it as fast as possible. Don't look at it. Don't talk to it. Just get far, far away. He promised her every time, but as he got older, he started to forget his grandma's stories letting them fade away with memories of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. He didn't think about the stories again until he was older, a junior in college and embarking on a camping trip with his roommate Josh. They were both staying with Zane's family for the summer and had been enjoying the sunshine and fresh air. They'd gone hiking, picked blackberries, and gone fishing to their heart's content. After a while, they got sick of sleeping in the cramped house and decided to have a proper camping trip out in the mountains. Campsites were crowded this time of year, but Zane knew a spot just isolated enough that they could kick back, enjoy nature, and relax in peace. They packed their supplies and headed out into the forest for a weekend they would never forget. By nightfall, Zane and Josh had pitched their tents, built a fire, and were starting to make some dinner. They roasted hot dogs and heated cans of beans over the fire and decided to start telling some classic scary stories. Sitting by the crackling fire, listening to the rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and the chittering of animals all around, Zane couldn't help but remember the stories he had almost forgotten. All of the strange, inexplicable things that came out after the sun went down and the forest went quiet. He thought he could hear the footsteps of something walking by their campsite, circling them. But it was probably just his imagination. As Josh told stories about babysitters stalked by killers and drivers picking up ghostly hitchhikers, Zane was thinking about the deer. He shuddered but shook it off, and after some more stories and a few too many s'mores, the two friends decided to get some sleep. After several hours, Zane woke to the sound of Josh unzipping his tent. He sat up, ready to yell at his friend for waking him up, but the sight of Josh's pale, frightened face stopped him. There's something here, was all Josh could say. His hands, Zane noticed, were shaking. Hey man, it's, it's okay, let's check it out. Zane patted Josh on the shoulder. He was pretty sure his friend just wasn't used to camping in actual nature, but reached for his hunting knife just in case. He grabbed a flashlight and switched it on, following Josh out into the darkness. He swept the beam across the clearing, and it illuminated a pair of orange eyes staring directly at him from behind a nearby tree. What the? He approached the shape, trying to get a clear look at it. As it became more illuminated, his stomach dropped. It was a deer, but something was wrong with it. Its mouth was wide open, its jaw working up and down like it was trying to make a sound, but nothing came out. 
But that wasn't the worst part. As the flashlight beam illuminated the animal's body, Zane realized that somehow, its head was on backwards. What the? Josh appeared behind him gasping. Shh! Zane shushed him intensely. He suddenly remembered his grandmother's warnings. You know what? I don't feel so great. I think we should go back to the car and head to my place. He gave Josh a look, shaking his head as if to say, don't say another word. By the glow of their flashlights, the two packed up their campsite, all under the gaze of the misshapen deer. They drove home in silence, Josh only speaking once to ask, what was that thing? Zane shook his head. I don't know, but it wasn't a deer. They crept back into the house and went to bed. They knew they would never speak of tonight ever again. As Zane began to drift off to sleep, his last conscious thought was to glance out the window. There in the yard, not five feet away, was a deer watching. He didn't know it, but that night Zane encountered an instance of SCP-6448. SCP-6448 is an anomalous species of creatures that appear to belong to the Cervidae family, nicknamed the Not Deer. They are highly intelligent and can be distinguished from ordinary deer by unusual behavior and physical deformities. Some of these have included legs that bend backwards, the eyes of an animal other than deer, forward-facing eyes, jerky movements, lack of fear towards humans, and walking on two hind legs. Most notably and most frightening, SCP-6448 instances will watch and stalk humans for a duration of hours or even days. They will follow humans home and steal items from their domains including weapons, food, and other personal items. They are most frequently found in the deep woods at night when a person is completely alone. If someone encounters an instance of SCP-6448, if they acknowledge any of the creature's anomalous traits, it will attack. In order to limit the loss of life and ensure that the SCP Foundation employees exercise the utmost caution when dealing with SCP-6448, the Cryptozoology Division issued the following guidelines. If you notice a deer that seems off, look away and ignore it. If it knows that you've noticed it, it's too late. If you hear your name, whistling, or something else in the woods calling for you, don't acknowledge it. Never acknowledge it exists. Don't respond. Don't go looking for it. Don't call back to it. If you're walking at night and you feel something breathing on your neck or whispering behind you, the key to your safety is pretending that everything is normal. Your survival is dependent on your ignorance. Whatever SCP-6448 is, they appear to be intelligent enough to understand when they are being studied, and they don't seem to like it very much. On January 11, 1994, a group of three SCP-6448 instances broke into Site-41 in North Carolina, using a tunnel they had carved over a long period of time. At the time, there was an instance in containment, but in all of the chaos of the breach, the specimen was lost. Every time an instance was captured and contained near SCP-6448's habitat, it would later escape via similar tunnels. SCP-6448 was officially classified by the SCP Foundation in 1980, but those from the Appalachian region have known about these strange creatures since at least 1947. From folktales and campfire stories to second-hand and even first-hand encounters, the locals are aware of the Not Deer's existence and are largely familiar with the precautions necessary to avoid them. Though many of the civilians that encounter SCP-6448 avoid notifying the authorities, there have been several recorded 911 calls involving the Not Deer since 2000. The following is a log of those calls. February 1st, 2000. Victim, age 41 female, dialed emergency services after hearing their name being called from the woods near their home. The victim recounts the vocalization being likened to a scream in a voice that they do not recognize and requested assistance in locating the source. Emergency personnel requested the subject place their phone on the floor outside the home to listen for the alleged sounds. After two minutes, a vocalization was heard that was calling to the subject by name, emanating from the nearby forest. The subject was instructed to investigate the disturbance themselves and keep services updated on the situation. The victim then began to walk into the woodland, getting about 50 meters into the underbrush before inexplicably stopping. They claim there to be a noticeably large deer standing in the way of the path. She begins to walk closer, 
though states it does not move. Subject diverts from the path and begins walking in a different direction. After 30 minutes, no source of the voice is determined. The caller returns to their residence. June 13, 2002. Victim, age 28, male, calls 911 regarding a home break-in. The caller notes numerous items to be missing from their residence and requests an investigation. Operators dispatch two investigators to visit the home and, and pertain a potential perpetrator. The pair note that based on earlier CCTV images, all cutlery, sharp objects, firearms, light bulbs, and a single copy of the novel The Day After Roswell are missing. Also noted is that there is a complete lack of any fingerprints at the scene, with no doors or windows having been broken into. Analysis of the home's CCTV footage revealed there to be a two-hour period of missing film, with the exception of a single frame containing a service nippin on its hind legs reaching towards the camera. Its frontal hooves have been warped to resemble fingers. No footage of the entity exiting the home was discovered. November 19, 2005 a cattle farmer, age 54 male, reported to local authorities the sudden disappearance of over 30% of his largest herd. Response teams searched the nearby area for four hours though found no trace of his cattle. The victim was recommended to set up trail cameras and note any unusual activity overnight. At 1.11 a.m., two SCP-6448 are seen walking through the field before fleeing. One places an object into the ground, later discovered to be a single fork. A week after this discovery, 200 discarded bovine hooves appear at the location. March 4, 2009. Victim, age unknown, gender unknown, dials 911 to request assistance from animal services. The victim is standing within a forest in front of a service elephus, which is violently contorting. The victim attempts to state, you better get a vet or something, I don't think it's well, before a piercing screech is heard and the line falls silent. Recovered footage depicts the aforementioned animal squirming, seemingly in pain. A vicious churning is audible as a black mass erupts out of the instance, and the video turns to static. October 11, 2012. Victim, age 23 male, is a junior wildlife officer at the Cherokee National Forest, Tennessee. They radio their supervisor in the early morning regarding a herd of Odicolius virginius within the reserve. Supposedly, there is a single animal that, upon first glance, appears average, though possesses divergent attributes, including backwards joints, enlarged abdomen, and forward-facing eyes. Upon stating this, a distant whistle is audible, and the victim stumbles slightly. They begin to say, What the? Did it just whistle at me? Before the sound of hooves rapidly getting closer is heard. Notably, the hoofsteps did not sound to be in the traditional gallop of a cervid. October 12, 2012. The former victim's supervisor calls authorities following the victim's absence from the reserve night shift. Following this, their radio begins to crackle. The victim's voice can be heard on the other end, and he requests the supervisor's attention. He calls regarding a herd of Odicolius virginius within the reserve. They claim there is a single animal that upon first glance appears average though possesses divergent attributes including backwards joints, enlarged abdomen, and forward-facing eyes. Suspecting the creature to be a rare genetic malformation, the victim requests their supervisor to come to the location. The supervisor questions the victim about what happened the night previous. There is no reply. Upon the supervisor's and law enforcement's arrival at the site, a herd of approximately 80 Odicolius virginius was present. A single entity is in the field center and appears to be standing separate from the rest of the group. It flees the scene upon realizing the law enforcement's presence. Where it formerly stood lay a standard two-way radio. April 8, 2016. Victim, age 35, female, dials 911 using a satellite phone distressed. They state they are in Redacted. County Woods and are being followed. She claims that despite seeing no one for the duration of her hike, she, quote, feels as if she's being watched, and has heard someone walking behind her at various points in the trip. The victim is unable to give an adequate description of their location, but knows the route to return to her residence. Operators request the victim to return to a point wherein she can provide a sufficient geographic description of her position. The victim remains on the line for the duration of the hike back to a readily used portion of the wilderness trail. Along the journey, various unnatural sounds can be heard. These include footsteps, rock slides, coughing, whispering, and whistling. Nearing the main trail, all woodland noises such as birds and wind cease suddenly, 
and the victim states she can see a malformed deer carcass coated in a thick layer of black slime. At this time, human screams can be heard in the distance. Operators request the victim continue and ignore the other stimuli. Agents embedded in local law enforcement, suspecting SCP-6448 involved, notify Gamma-4 to the situation. Twenty minutes later, the victim returns to the main trail. Gamma-4, now operating the 911 call, informs the victim not to respond to any further unusual activity and briefly outlines service protocol. For the duration of the victim's journey to her home, two sets of breathing are audible. The victim successfully returns to her residence and shuts the door behind her. Now out of sight from SCP-6448, agents inquire of the victim's address, and the victim promptly complies. Operatives instruct the victim to have possession of all firearms and weapons on the premises and to barricade herself inside a safe space with one exit point. The victim swiftly begins grabbing all available weapons and throwing them inside a wardrobe. It is at this time there is a knock on the front door. The victim does not respond and continues to hoard sharp objects from kitchen drawers. The knocking becomes more violent as the handle is jostled and is shaken incessantly. A voice on the other side repeats the phrase, Hello, it is me. Hello, let me in. In a calm manner as the door begins to shake. The victim retreats to her wardrobe, armed with a small firearm. Upon sealing herself in the space, the knocking ceases, and footsteps can be heard becoming further away. The sound of galloping is audible as the front door caves in. Hoofsteps can now be heard inside the home. The entity continues to repeat, Hello, it is me. Hello, let me in, as it searches the small building. A bright light flashes overhead, seemingly circling the house. Eventually, the entity enters the victim's bedroom. Through a small slit in the wardrobe door, the victim can see a Cervus canadensis standing on its hind legs and surveying the room. Its movements are crooked and stiff, seeming to struggle to stand in a bipedal fashion. It slouches down to a quadrupedal crouch, similar to the stance of an arachnid. It inhales heavily, and its head locks on the view of the wardrobe. It is noted as possessing human eyes. It scampers towards the subject and opens the door. A single gunshot is heard. Responders found no trace of either SCP-6448 or the victim. Containment of SCP-6448 is focused on the investigation of any deer exhibiting anomalous traits in and around the Appalachian area. Any civilian sightings of SCP-6448 are to be handled by Mobile Task Force Gamma-4 or the Green Stags. Any possible deaths resulting from SCP-6448 will be blamed on hiking accidents, and any reported sightings can be explained away with chronic wasting disease. CWD, occasionally referred to as zombie deer disease, is a prion disease affecting members of the Cervidae family. Symptoms of the illness include loss of motor function control and damage to decision-making, as well as gradual degradation of all mental faculties. It is 100% fatal. However, though the disease does exist, most recorded cases of it in the Appalachian region can actually be attributed to instances of SCP-6448. Any captured instances of SCP-6448 should be transported to Site-44 for the Cryptozoology Division's containment and study. On November 29, 2019, they finally got their chance to bring a not-deer into custody. The Green Stags were able to capture an instance of SCP-6448 with the help from MTF New 7 Hammerdown and their Heavy Vehicles Division, as well as some experimental shock rifles. One not deer was knocked unconscious in the conflict, and its body was loaded onto an armored helicopter and flown straight to Site-44 in Essex, England. At the site, it was then placed in a reinforced steel containment cell and heavily sedated. This entire process went off without a hitch. As the entity began to regain consciousness, cryptozoology specialist F. Oz watched it through a one-way glass window and attempted to speak to it through the intercom. Greetings, SCP-6448, researcher Oz began. At the sound of his voice, the creature jumped to its feet, staring at the intercom. Can you understand me? We've seen your genus speak English just fine in the past. The animal did not answer, but began licking one of its legs and behaving as if it were an ordinary deer. Researcher Oz sighed impatiently. Please, we know your secret. The not deer stopped what it was doing, freezing completely still as it listened to the words. Admittedly, it wasn't exactly well kept. If you just look at yourself for more than a few seconds, it is very clear that you're not normal. 
At this, the creature, which had been facing away from the window, swiveled its neck 180 degrees, breaking its own spine with an audible crack. It stared unblinking at the window and directly at researcher Oz. Oz turned to the containment staff, suddenly anxious. I thought you said this was one way. The staff assured him that it was, and there was no way the not deer could see him. Still, its eyes were locked directly on his face. He shook off the sense of unease and continued his line of questioning. Are you something imitating deer? It is clear that if so, you possess basic anatomical knowledge of them, though details are clearly faulty. In fact, a better question would be, how, if in fact you are not what you pretend to be? The not deer opened its mouth at this, revealing unusually sharp teeth. It moved its jaw as if attempting to speak, but only a choking sound came out. <clears throat> Sh shall we move on? Oz asked. What I'm more concerned with here is why you take our people. Is it a vendetta? Spite? Food? For the first time in the interview, the not deer blinked. It was an unnatural movement, forced and deliberate, like the creature was attempting to engage in an ordinary behavior rather than actually experiencing an involuntary impulse. Responding is mandatory, researcher Oz prompted. The creature did not react. If you will not comply, Oz's tone grew stern, frustrated, maybe you'd like to see your brand new containment cell. At last, the entity spoke. Research. Research. Its voice resembled a distorted version of Oz's. Research? What kind of... Oz wasn't able to finish his question. July 7th, 1947, the creature said before ramming into the one-way glass and cracking it. As Oz stumbled backwards from the force, the creature collapsed on the ground, seizing and screaming as its abdomen. Get the stags in here now! Oz cried out, but it was too late. A black mass of something shiny and tendril leaped out of the not deer, scuttling around the cell before shattering the window and leaving the empty shell of a deer behind. The Site-44 breach system activated and attempted to initiate emergency containment protocols, but the mysterious black mass escaped its sector, made its way toward the main exit, broke through the glass of the front exit door, and vanished into the shrubbery outside. The escaped anomaly could not be found and recontained. Ever since this incident, there have been a record-breaking number of chronic wasting disease cases identified in deer in the surrounding area, as well as an unprecedented increase in UFO reports. Further research is currently ongoing, but it is unknown whether we will ever truly know what these creatures are. Only one thing is for certain. They are definitely not deer. Before we start today's video, we need to ask you a question. Are you alone in the room? Seriously, are you alone? You may think the room around you is empty, but how can you really know that, right? Think of the technology out there being developed by groups like DARPA, the CIA, or even the SCP Foundation. Secret agents in cloaking suits could be standing around you right now, watching your every move without you even knowing. You could tell someone about this, but if you did, they'd think you're crazy. And nobody believes crazy people, do they? Sometimes people's whole worlds just collapse. One day they're living happy, successful lives with families and friends who love and care about them. Then the next day, they're truly convinced that the US government is tapping not only their phone calls and their emails, but their thoughts. Perhaps even putting dangerous brainwaves directly into their mind. Or they start to believe that those loving family members and friends seek to do them harm. Maybe they start to believe their food is poisoned and stop eating, causing them to waste away from malnutrition. Most terrifying of all, maybe they start to see things that nobody else could see. Monsters that defy rationality and shake the very soul. Terrible, terrible things. These are all sadly relatively common symptoms of someone suffering from a severe case of schizophrenia, a mental illness with a wide range of detrimental effects to sufferers, first and foremost giving them an incredibly complicated relationship with reality. There's sadly a lot of misconceptions in the media about people who suffer from illnesses like schizophrenia, painting them as unstable individuals who present a danger to the people around them. In reality, people with a condition like these are three times more likely to be a victim of a violent crime, and they're also more likely to be a victim of something else, too. Like we said earlier, sometimes people's worlds just collapse, and in severe cases, they might simply drop off the map. 
And nine times out of 10, the reason for that is SCP-870, the maybe there monsters. Take the experience of Katrina Wayne. She was an office temp in Tallahassee, Florida, with an undiagnosed case of mild schizophrenia. For the most part, she was able to operate just fine at her job, getting her work done at a satisfactory level while also maintaining a decent social life after hours. It came as a shock to everyone when she began screeching horrifically in the middle of the office. She backed herself up against the wall, picking up nearby objects and throwing them into the aisles at some invisible foe. And this isn't a metaphor. There really was an invisible foe moving towards her, and only she could truly see it. Seeing the huge, scaly body of a mature alligator from the Florida Everglades moving towards you would be scary enough on its own, but this wasn't any ordinary alligator. Its long reptilian head had three eyes instead of two, and it moved towards her on eight huge, articulated spider legs. It was like something straight out of a nightmare. Katrina was put on leave due to a stress-induced mental breakdown and prescribed a course of antipsychotic medication by a psychiatrist. She disappeared from her home without a trace a mere two weeks later. Or take the story of Daryl Simon. He was a mechanic working in Michigan with a family history of schizophrenia, though he'd never been officially diagnosed himself. He was working on the engine of a vintage Corvette when something strange happened. His garage began to fill up with smoke. He considered that at first perhaps it was some kind of engine malfunction causing smoke to belch out of the old Corvette's tailpipe. But then he saw something standing in the smoke. A human figure. Daryl suddenly felt a profound sense of dread seeping into his mind. He grabbed a monkey wrench and began to slowly approach the intruder standing in the smoke. It was only when he was already too close that he realized the figure wasn't just standing in the smoke. It was made of smoke. The second he noticed this, the figure's eyes opened glowing red. Its smoky face opened into a wide, toothy mouth and let out an ear-splitting shriek. Daryl suddenly found himself running as the creature gave chase. He threw his wrench as it ran. It breezed through the creature's semi-intangible form. Daryl was found later that day huddled in the corner of his garage, muttering incoherently. After seeing a mental health professional and sharing his story, he was given a schizophrenia diagnosis. He was given a mix of talk therapy and medication and seemed to be improving over time. He would occasionally report hallucinations of the man made of smoke, watching from the corner of his eye, but it was dismissed as nothing more than that, a hallucination. A month later, he was gone, never to be seen again. But he wasn't the only one to fall victim to the anomaly. Shirley Nicholson, a retiree whose schizophrenic symptoms developed later in life, was having a quiet evening in her home when she first encountered an instance of SCP-870. She was watching a game show on television when she heard a strange noise coming from her kitchen, a rustling, like someone was messing with the food inside her fridge. Of course, she always had a tendency to hear things, which was why she wasn't that nervous when she got up and walked to the kitchen. That sense of confidence didn't last long. When she entered the kitchen, she saw the fridge door open, with the back half of what looked like a giant ant emerging from it. Her breath caught in her throat. That giant ant, which seemed to be eating the food inside her fridge, suddenly froze, seeming to realize that Shirley had entered the room. When it backed out of the fridge, Shirley couldn't help but scream. Instead of antennas and mandibles, the giant ant had a grinning human face. As Shirley screamed, the giant ant's human face began to cackle with sadistic glee. Its jaw began to stretch open, impossibly wide, exposing the never-ending darkness within. Shirley turned and ran as the creature skittered towards her at a frightening speed. Adrenaline kicked in and Shirley ran for her life as the monster pursued her through the house. It was only when she ran out into the street and was seen by others in this bizarre outburst that the horrifying ant monster seemed to disappear. And several weeks after her schizophrenia diagnosis, Shirley Nicholson sadly disappeared too. Before she vanished, she made a panicked 911 call, where she screamed down the line that the monster had come back. No explanation has yet to be found, but there are more cases to be investigated still. Don Jones, who had a documented history with schizophrenia, had his SCP-870 experience while waiting for the bus out of town late one October evening. He was checking his phone at the bus stop when he saw a figure shuffling towards him in the distance. He tried to ignore it at first. Years of therapy had taught him to try his best to ignore these strange little anomalies. He had been medicated for years, and while occasionally he had minor episodes, he'd lived with the condition for long enough now that he'd learned how to cope. That was when the strange shuffling figure got closer. Don looked up just for a moment 
to see the thing coming towards him out of the dark. It was about the size of a child, though a little shorter because of how far the creature was hunched over. Literally, hunched. The entity had a rather prominent hunchback, but this wasn't nearly as noticeable as the thing's face. It had the head of a particularly mangy-looking parrot, its curved beak caked in what looked like old blood. This was stranger than some of the hallucinations he'd suffered in the past. It looked more tangible, more real, even after years of medication and therapy. He felt nervous as the thing approached him. On some subconscious level, he knew the thing intended to harm him in one way or another. When it opened its mouth and sunk the bladed tip of its beak into Don's hand, he knew that he wasn't dealing with any mundane fantasy here. He screamed and ran off into the night, the monster giving chase. He later reported the incident to the police, but his fears were written off when his medical history came to light. Everyone just assumed the man was experiencing another episode, and that the wound in his hand was self-inflicted. Of course, as you've probably gathered by this point, poor Don Jones would disappear without a trace not long after. Still, the testimonies get freakier. A warehouse security guard, Alex Landry, had his terrifying encounter while on the job. He was on his nightly patrol when he heard a strangely soft skittering noise coming from inside the warehouse. He deployed his flashlight and ran inside after radioing for assistance. He was expecting maybe an escaped animal or a young hoodlum messing around inside. What he didn't expect was a face-to-face -face encounter with pure terror. As his flashlight beam traced its way up to the top of the warehouse, he saw a monster crawling across the ceiling. It was a giant 15-foot-long centipede, but instead of having normal centipede legs, it had scores of twitching, grasping human arms. He was found in a comatose state by his partner, and spent the brief rest of his life in a psychiatric facility before, you guessed it, disappearing without a trace. And most exhilaratingly, we come to the tale of Mr. Holgate, which both ends a little more hopeful for him, but paints a grim picture of what happened to everyone else. Mr. Holgate had encountered a spider-like creature with a freakish number of legs, which he soon realized only he could see. During his periods of observation, he'd seen the creature both devour a ruler, as in the measurement device, not a king, as well as swallow a human whole after an extended period of stalking the victim, leaving nothing behind, just like the SCP-870 instances had done to all of their other victims. When the monster eventually came for Holgate, he was ready. It ran screeching towards him on its too many legs, and Holgate whipped out a gun and shot it. The Foundation had prioritized the capture or destruction of SCP-870. It's believed to be not a single instance, but an entire species, living out there, preying on humans and hiding in the space between our perceptions. Even two schizophrenic people looking at the same instance will report seeing completely different entities. The monsters are all the more dangerous due to the fact that sufferers of severe schizophrenia often report hallucinations of strange monsters or entities, so their pleas for help are often ignored by neurotypical authorities. Neurotypical meaning those who don't experience any form of mental illness, personality disorder, or developmental condition. People who can never see SCP-870 coming until they're already being swallowed whole. The lead researcher on the SCP-870 case follows up the file on the monsters with an ominous note that leaves little comfort for even those of us who don't suffer from schizophrenia. The note reads, I personally don't believe that the schizophrenics are really seeing SCP-870 fully. They can just see it more than us. We don't see it because our brains aren't made to see it. The schizophrenics, their brains are wired up just that tiny bit differently, and they can see it just a tiny bit more. These things have the perfect camouflage, and we simply are unable to see through it. To return to what we said at the very beginning of this video, look around the room and answer our question. Are you alone? Now, at least you know the answer to that question may not be as simple as it seems. The clank of heavy metal bars echoing through the building usually kept Avi up at night, but he never thought that he would ever come to miss that sound one day. As he tossed and turned in his uncomfortable bunk, he couldn't help that the noise reminded him of how confined he was and how trapped he felt within. It had been a mistake, an honest and completely unpredictable mistake. On the nights that sleep evaded him, he'd always replayed the events over and over again, his daughter Callie calling him out of the blue, her distorted, uncontrollable sobs playing into his ear over the phone. Avi remembered jumping into the car and flooring the accelerator 
rain drumming against the windshield as he drove all the way across town to her apartment in the early hours of the morning. And then there was the scene that awaited him as he stepped through the door. The mess that had been of her kitchen, covering the floor, smeared up the walls, even dripping off the ceiling. It all stayed there as Avi debated with his daughter about what they should do next. She was crying, begging for her dad's help, suggesting that they should clean the place from top to bottom and hide any evidence scattered around the apartment. Laying in his cell all those months later, he sometimes wondered why he said no to that idea. Instead, they came up with a story, a falsified version of events. Avi made Kali swear to stick to it, no matter what, and through heavy sobs, she agreed. Then after they'd been over every detail and had it perfect, Avi got back in his car and drove to the nearest police precinct to turn himself in. All while taking the fall, pleading guilty in court, and being sentenced to prison, he reminded himself over and over that he was doing it for Kali. No matter what she had done, whatever accidents had happened, she was still his kid, and he would do anything to protect her. But that was part of what made it sting so bad. Not being locked up, but not getting to see her. Despite making request after request, Avi was denied visitation rights when seeing his daughter and knowing she was alright were the only things that would have made this struggle easier. It was after his 20th request that a guard informed Avi that he was being moved. At first, he assumed move meant to another part of the prison, maybe with more lax security and the right to see Kali, but they didn't mean moved. They meant transferred. Into the care of an organization Avi came to know as the SCP Foundation. It was different here. The kind of people he was locked up with as a member of D-Class personnel were some of the most heinous criminals on the planet. But there was something else going on. Something weirder. Avi would overhear whispers and rumors from the other D-Classes. They'd talk of experiments conducted by the Foundation, with them as the lab rats. D-14164! The researcher greeted him as he was pulled into a side room flanked on all sides by armed Foundation guards. Yours is quite the interesting case. No priors, no criminal affiliations of any kind, hardly any family to testify to your innocence, and yet what you did. Ugh. Now that takes some guts. If you pardon the pun. So it, it's all true then, Avi replied solemnly. You're here to say you want to experiment on me. I wouldn't call it an experiment, per se. The researcher smiled smugly. Let's use the word expedition as a nicer ring to it, don't you think? An expedition to where? He asked. I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Then I won't go, Avi shrugged. Listen closely, D14164. The SCP Foundation has, well, let's say a considerable influence across the globe. What we're asking you to agree to is involvement in possibly one of the most dangerous operations we have ever conducted. Now, as unappealing as that might sound, allow me to sweeten the deal. Should you say yes, agree to take part, and follow our instructions, then you might find that the Foundation's influence may be rather beneficial to you, should you survive. The researcher paused to push a document across the table, close enough for Avi to read. A clean record. That one nasty mistake wiped clean for good. On top of that, an immediate release and a new identity. You'd have a second chance, Mr. Garrett. Both you and your daughter would. And what if I say no? Avi asked bluntly. Well, that's your prerogative, the researcher replied. And we won't be able to detain you after releasing evidence of your innocence, so you'll be free no matter what. Oh, although your daughter will, of course, be remanded into custody given that she is actually guilty. Maybe once we get her moved to D-Class, she might be more willing to cooperate than her dear old dad. Under the table, Avi's hands were shaking with rage. He clenched his fists so furiously that the cuffs felt tighter around his wrists. The hate in his eyes was palpable as he glared at the researcher. It was bad enough that they had backed him into a corner, put him in a situation where in saying yes or no would be equally catastrophic. But what felt worse was that they knew what Kali had done, and they were using that as a threat. Taking a deep breath, Avi steadied himself before finally speaking up again. Just tell me what you want me to do. Instantly, he'd felt like he'd been thrown headfirst into a commotion he could barely keep up with. No sooner had he said that, Avi had been led away by a team of Foundation guards while the researcher followed, rattling off vague information about the expedition. 
Guided by the armed escort into another room, Avi was flocked by more Foundation staff, strapping electronic equipment over the outside of his orange prisoner garb. One piece of it was to monitor his heart rate. Another was a portable camera to record his surroundings, although those were among the few details that he was actually able to catch during all the activity. Avi couldn't help but notice how nobody had even mentioned just where he was meant to be going on this expedition, just that the Foundation wanted to keep a close eye on him while he was there. You still haven't told me exactly where it is I'm meant to be going, he finally spoke up, or how I'm getting there. All in good time, the head researcher replied. So far, the only detail you need to be aware of is this. It's dangerous, a particularly hostile environment. So, like a war zone, Avi asked. The researcher smiled, but to themselves, as if there was something funny about the question and lack of understanding it conveyed. Avi's attention was quickly turned to another D-Class wearing a similar D-Class uniform to him. The staff began preparing the second convict in the same room, although without nearly as much gear as they'd given Avi. I thought I was the only one going on this trip, he stated. Oh, don't worry, that's just the lure, the researcher explained, though it only raised more questions. They won't be accompanying you. It was then Avi was led out of the prep room and walked through the Foundation facility. The place was a hive of activity as well as noise. There were alien shrieks and wails, monstrous sounds emanating from deep in the building, muffled only slightly underneath thick layers of concrete and heavy steel doors. On top of that, there were screams, too. Distinctly human sounds of pain and fear. Avi tried to ignore it as he was instructed to keep walking, feeling almost nostalgic for the clank of metal bars back at his old cell. He had been anticipating being taken out of the facility, towards maybe a helipad or a runway where an aircraft would be waiting to fly him out to his undisclosed destination. In fact, even a dock with a moored boat would have been more within the realm of what he expected. But instead, he was taken deeper and deeper into the Foundation's sprawling complex, passing testing areas and containment levels through winding corridors, until Avi was told to stop in front of a heavy door that held a containment area beyond. He couldn't help but notice that the door itself looked brand new, like it had only just been installed. Meanwhile, the frames surrounding it had traces of discoloring and damage, almost as if something corrosive had melted away the previous door, hence the replacement. This is it? Avi asked, confused but still trying to nudge more information out of the Foundation staff. You want me to do an expedition within your own building? Yes and no, the head researcher replied, still giving next to no useful details. Now this is important. Once you get to your destination, we need you to figure out how to get back to us. You do that, and you'll have your freedom, your daughter, and your second chance. Surely to get back I can just open up this door again, the prisoner said. That garnered a slight chuckle from the researcher, again seeming to find Avi's lack of understanding amusing. Ha! <sighs> oh, D14164, if only it was that simple. The door opened with a heaving metallic creak, and Avi was unceremoniously pushed inside by the guards. Staggering inside, catching himself, before he lost his balance and fell over, he almost turned back to start slamming his fists against the now sealed entrance. He would have were not for the sight of something oozing out of the wall directly in front of him. Avi stepped closer to inspect it, but withdrew his hand as he noticed thick, black droplets leaking onto the floor. The substance hissed as it made contact with the ground, like it was burning through, corroding whatever it came into contact with. Keeping himself from touching it, Avi leaned in to get a closer look, and found the grotesque face of SCP-106 looking back at him. A spindly, decrepit hand reached out of the gooey puddle and grabbed the orange material of Avi's jumpsuit, pulling at the garment with enough strength to tug his entire body forward. In a blind panic, Avi tried to swipe the old man's rotting arm away, feeling an intense burning, almost like a chemical scalding his skin as the same black ooze burned through his clothing and started to singe his chest. Another hand shot forward out of the puddle on the wall, a clawed thumb puncturing Avi's side, he screamed in pain as he felt the blistering digit pierce into him, while the rest of the fingers pulled him closer still to the wall, using the hole in his side like a handle. The stench of his own burning flesh mixed with the air of rotting decay that SCP-106 brought with it everywhere. The decaying face of the old man peered through the black slime on the wall, its mouth locked in a sadistic, sinister grin as Avi found himself pulled inside. It almost felt like he had fallen asleep in the bathtub, 
and woke up gasping and spluttering, just having narrowly avoided drowning. Except now he was waking up in an entirely different space, the transition there having done little to dull the pain of his injuries. Sitting up as he arrived in his new dark and desolate surroundings, Avi gripped his side and winced at the searing pain. Then, the sudden smell of burning plastic crawled up his nostrils and down the back of his throat. Most of the equipment the Foundation had strapped onto him was melting, the heart rate monitor and camera corroding, covered in more of that black sludge. Standing up, gritting his teeth through the pain of his wounds, Avi quickly removed the devices as carefully as he could. He was far beyond caring about the Foundation's expedition right now. He just wanted to get back out of wherever the hell this place was. Checking over his shoulder, the slick, corrosive puddle he'd been pulled through was already gone. At any rate, Avi didn't particularly like the idea of going back that way, so was relieved, although he'd soon find out that relief was perhaps misplaced. He had barely a few moments to examine his surroundings, not that there was much he could see besides endless dark corridors and the withered figure of the old man. It had reappeared, looking like it was far off in the distance before, in a split second, the gap between SCP-106 and Avi had closed. The creature tilted its bald, skeletal head as it looked at him, and he got a full, unobscured glimpse at its sunken eyes and face locked in a perpetual, lipless grin. The rotting, wrinkly flesh of the old man's body was oozing more and more of that dark, disgusting mucus, droplets of it landing on Avi's clothing and burning holes right through. One hand still applying pressure to his side, Avi turned and tried to run as far and fast as his body was able. If getting away was his sole objective, he wanted out as quick as possible, anything to get away from the nightmarish creature he had now found himself trapped with. Running didn't seem to work, though. He was sure he had made it at least a few feet. The old man was still standing behind him, but looked to be at more of a distance. That was, until Avi noticed his legs. They were running backwards. Each step he had taken away from SCP-106 was being reversed, rewound like on an old VHS tape bringing him back closer and closer to the creature's clutches. Its claws pushed painfully through Avi's back as it reversed time right back to the point where he had turned to run away. As the old man reached through him, more of that burning, acidic pain started eating away at its captive D-class prey, with Avi letting out a pain scream. It wasn't until several minutes in that he realized something that hurt almost just as bad. SCP-106 could have killed him in an instant, that much was clear, but it hadn't. It had chosen not to. Instead, it was torturing him, prolonging the pain Avi was experiencing, because it wanted him to suffer. With all its strength, SCP-106 hurled him several feet, until Avi's burning, corroded body collided with a hard surface, a wall with a loud crack. The old man then manipulated time within his pocket dimension, causing Avi to fly backward through the air back into the creature's corrosive grip. It allowed time to keep winding back, undoing all the damage it had done so far. As much as Avi was relieved to be rid of the searing pain he was in, a sick worry deep in the pit of his stomach told him that this wasn't an act of mercy. The old man just wanted to make him suffer all over again. He lost track of how long it went on for, SCP-106 taking sick glee and hurting his captive, only to reverse the time within the pocket dimension and do it all again. Each time felt just like the first, made worse by the fact that Avi never had a chance to get used to the pain, to become numb to it. Instead, every moment the torture started was just like the first time. In fact, it technically was. Screaming in agony, Avi had no clue if he had been there for hours, days, months, or even years. Had any time passed at all? How many times had the old man done this to him, only to reverse time and do it all over again, letting the pain begin anew? Every few tries, the old man would release Avi for a moment, but once again, it was never done out of any sense of mercy or kindness. It was so it could hunt him. Still, Avi ran every time as far and fast as he could, searching every corner of that dark, desolate place for some kind of a way out. A portal home, another one of those corrosive black puddles, a big door with exit written on it in big letters. But instead, all he found was SCP-106. Or rather, the old man found him. It was hunting him again. Avi had no idea how many times this made. Panting, he slowed to a halt, trying to catch his breath. 
Reaching out in the dark, he put a hand against a nearby hard surface, a wall, then felt a crack under his hand. Examining closer, although he could barely see it, Avi could feel with absolute certainty that this wall had been damaged just a little. It was the same one, the exact same wall he had been thrown against, who knew how long ago. But the point was, it was still cracked from where his body had hit it, even after the old man had reversed time to hurt Avi over and over again. The damage had stayed. He had no way of knowing if it would work or how long it would take, but it might have been a way out. Desperately, Avi slammed his fist against the wall, feeling pain shooting through his fingers and up into his arm as it collided with the solid surface. Nothing changed. Winding back the other arm, he hit it again. Still nothing. Avi could hear the old man shuffling closer behind him, could sense his hands reaching out closer to torture him again. He let it happen striking one last blow against the wall before it finally reached him, and the pain began once more, only to be reversed so that SCP-106 could do it again. But now he had a goal. Each time the creature rewound time and undid all the damage to its captive's body, Avi went looking for that same wall, feeling across every surface until he reached it again. The damage was still there, only a tiny crack for now, but time despite being under the old man's control in this pocket dimension, was on Avi's side. Whenever he made it back to the wall, he started to punch it again, pounding one fist against it after the other. He didn't relent. Despite the pain it caused him, he told himself it would be worth it if it meant a way out. Even the times when the bones in his hands broke and he was flimsily striking at the cracked wall with shattered fingers, he didn't stop. It would be worth it. It had to be, no matter how long it took he would gradually chip away at the wall more and more. Every time SCP-106 would find Avi, and when it did, it would hurt him. The pain he'd put himself through trying to break down the wall helped numb some of the torture before the old man reset everything again. Then, the hunt began again, and Avi went back to making his gradual dent in the wall. The whole time he remembered he was doing it for Kali, for his freedom, and a fresh start. Until, eventually, it stopped. Avi had no idea how many times he'd struck the wall, but it had been enough to start tumbling through it slightly, both hands bloody and broken again. But this time, the old man didn't appear. It had stopped. Screaming in rage, Avi started throwing himself at the indented wall, trying desperately to chip away more, completely unaware that SCP-106 had left him alone in its pocket dimension. Back in their facility, the Foundation had lost contact with Avi's recording devices over three hours ago, at which point they had initiated their recall protocol, injuring the D-Class they had chosen as a lure. Sure enough, the old man had reappeared from his pocket dimension, following the pain screams to come and finish the lure off. There was no sign of Avi, and with a sigh, the head researcher simply noted down, SCP-106 Pocket Dimension Escape Test. Result, test inconclusive. Modern cognitive neuroscience tells us that our memories are about as reliable as a weatherman at your local news channel. When a couple is asked, how did you first meet? They are lured into romanticized reflection. They might recall locking eyes at a school dance. They might recall the night being just perfect, despite the truth being far from it. We don't remember the spilled punch, the stepped on toes, or the st 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 stuttering. We only remember the X's and O's. Our memory doesn't find the needle by sifting through the haystack, but rather by lighting a match and setting the barn ablaze, until all that remains is the small piece of silver shining through the smoke. In this way, our memories are our best friends. They know exactly when to lie to us, feeding us misinformation about the past to satisfy ourselves in the present. Because if humans were capable of writing and recalling accurate personal accounts of their history, our memories would be stiff, unmarketable literature. And when a book gets boring, we tend to tap out. Just the same when our lives get monotonous, we tend to give up. So we have our faulty, biased brains to thank us for our perceived happiness and fulfillment. Our inaccurate memory systems consequently help us hide trauma, contrive purpose, and infuse unique importance into an otherwise banal existence. But let it be known, not all cerebral restructurings are gifts from psychology. Some are curses from SCPs, 
Which of these two possibilities is more existentially terrifying is up to you. SCP-5040 is a non-existent Japanese horror film entitled Tears of Blood, which spontaneously manifests in human memories. SCP-5040 is a master of persuasion. Those affected by SCP-5040 will remember going to see the film, even when their supposed attendance would contradict empirical evidence. It manipulates the mind into unwavering faith. While humans occasionally stumble upon the self-awareness to question their recollection, there are no documented instances of an individual doubting this specific memory. Somehow, beyond the Foundation's understanding, SCP-5040 manages to suspend the skepticism of its victims. They accept the memory as canon, as brute fact. Victims of SCP-5040 do not need a ticket stub to know they have been to the theater, and SCP-5040 afflictions can occur any place where movies are shown. It even transcends laws and navigates social norms. In cultures where its content would usually be prohibited by regulations and frowned upon by the public, it still inserts itself into the memory of its prey, and once that memory is planted, it's an event that can't be forgotten. Like the birth of your first child, like your favorite football team winning the Super Bowl, like the employee number you punch in and out of work every day for the rest of your life. It stamps itself into the forefront of the subject's brain, waving its arm, pleading to be recognized, begging for attention. Descriptions of the film are always similar in nature, as are the circumstances and events surrounding the viewing. However, reports of SCP-5040's story and characters are never fully consistent from one subject to the next, and the film's setting, subplots, character names, and much of the dialogue are different for each viewer. Whether this is SCP-5040's intent or inadequacy is unclear. Casting also varies and appears largely arbitrary. A broad variety of Japanese performers and entertainment personalities, both living and deceased, have been said to star in the film, even when the actor in question has no real-life associations with the horror genre. Imagine famous Japanese actor Pat Morita, better known as Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid, being the lead in a horror film. Despite the fact this would be a noticeably strange casting decision, SCP-5040 would still be taken seriously. Despite any and all deviations from expectations of the medium, SCP-5040 is seen as legitimate. Kinks in its design are overlooked by the viewer, similar to how our sleeping selves most often don't recognize we are dreaming, even when we encounter flying horses, friends with banana fingers, and leprechauns playing Pot Limit Omaha in Chris Hemsworth's basement. This may be because, despite all of its quirks, the film's core is sturdy. Its beginning, middle, and end are always in agreement. It doesn't stray from Robert McKee's universal structure of story. Not even the sick, twisted M. Night Shyamalan himself could have created a cinematic experience quite like this. After conducting more than 300 interviews, researchers have constructed a detailed synopsis of SCP-5040's most consistent story elements and the most common sequence of events associated with the viewer's memory of their screening attendance. There is no matinee with this movie. Screenings always begin at sunset. If there are obstacles standing in the way of the subject's attendance, SCP-5040 will see them removed. Dentist appointments, drinks with a friend, a long procrastinated date with the treadmill. All these commitments for that day and time will be pushed down the subject's list of priorities, making way for the movie. They will learn that their plans have been cancelled or resolved one way or another. The dentist's office burned to the ground. Your friend is suddenly sober. The model of treadmills at your gym have been recalled. Somehow, some way, time is freed up. And when life is kind enough to offer respite from personal and social obligations, it is modern humans' instinct to sit down and veg out. At this moment, the subjects decide to see a movie at a nearby theater. Upon arrival, the theater looks to be an entity in its own right. Long lines of patrons are like limbs extending from its center box office. Bright, blocky letters forming the film's title run across the marquee like a cheap tattoo. It is truly madness. A frenzied crowd gathers at the box office, pushing and shoving, clawing at the glass partition for a ticket. The entire theater has been reserved for this special event, a one-time-only screening of a rare, critically acclaimed film. Admission is entirely free. 
But is it actually free? Or has the cost just not declared itself? When the subject reaches the auditorium, they scan their eyes over the sea of people. Heads emerge from the backs of almost every seat. They can only find one empty space, and they have to shuffle like a crab to get past the mass of other viewers. In their seat, they notice that a large number of people throughout the audience are wearing disposable face masks. The woman sitting next to the subject's right wears one such mask, as does the woman on their left. And before you think, well, that isn't so weird, it's important to note that all of these accounts were taken years before certain recent events. Patrons continue to pack into the theater. Despite every chair being filled, more and more people enter. The aisles become overflow seating. Regulations of max occupancy are dismissed. In the darkness of the room, all that can be clearly seen are shapes. The rectangle that is the screen, the hundreds of circles that are the heads of the audience, but there is a shape that feels misplaced. What appears to be the letter P sticks up from the crowd, a thin line with a bulge protruding from the top. The specificity of its origin is difficult to define, but once the subject's eyes adjust to the dark, they notice it's an IV pole carrying a bag of unknown fluid. However, there is no clear indication of who it is connected to. Furthermore, they notice one of the masked audience members is wearing a hospital gown. There is little time to assess any of these strange visuals, because there are no trailers or advertisements before the film. As soon as the audience is settled into whatever space they might find temporarily habitable, the theater goes silent and the film begins. The film opens with the female protagonist going about mundane activities in her day-to-day -day life. A phone call interrupts her. It is an unknown party who tells her that a loved one has been hospitalized for one reason or another. The protagonist drops what she's doing to accept the call to action. On her way to the hospital, however, she is attacked by a male assailant and loses consciousness. The protagonist wakes up in a fog, unable to make sense of her surroundings, but the audience understands that wherever she is, she is in deep trouble. She's in a desolate and unfamiliar building with her arms and legs bound. She is accompanied by a number of other female captives, some of whom still remain seemingly unconscious or possibly dead. The women briefly discuss their strategy to escape, but they are interrupted when the kidnapper appears. Descriptions of hairstyle, eye color, and wardrobe would fall short in showing us who this character really is. Instead, his swift and decisive actions do the talking. He sees one of the women crying and kills her without hesitation. The kidnapper reveals to the woman the code he intended to operate under. He would release the captives after 24 hours, but only under the condition that they do not cry. During the film, the kidnapper demonstrates various forms of physical and psychological torture on the group of women. Despite their best efforts, the captives are unable to hold back their tears, and one by one, they are murdered until only the protagonist remains. Frustrated by the protagonist's unremarkable resolve, the kidnapper takes more extreme measures, increasing the intensity of her torture. However, the protagonist is not one to be messed with. Despite being tormented, she seems in control of the situation. She doesn't succumb to the traditional dynamics of torture. Even while on the wrong end of the bat, she isn't afraid to swing. She fights back how she can. She mocks and insults her captor, and it's then she finds his weakness. Although a physically empowering villain, he is emotionally fragile. Her grit frustrates him, causing him to lose focus and become noticeably rattled. As the protagonist continues to weaken her kidnapper with words, the subject in the audience notices what seems to be a slight echo in the dialogue. They look up to see if something is wrong with the speakers. They even wonder if this is a stylistic decision made by the director. But then they notice where it is coming from. They eventually realize that the two masked women sitting beside them are quietly repeating every line of dialogue as it occurs. Their lips moving causes their masks to shake softly. With each word, the air from their whispers blows the cloth away from their mouth, only for the mask to collapse back in when the syllable is completed. If the subject looks even closer, they will see that the lower half of the women's masks are saturated with saliva. Things don't get any more pleasant when the subject shifts their gaze down the women's body. Just near their waists, their hands are clasped together so tightly that their fingernails are digging into their skin. They tremble and fidget, as if having taken on the burden of the world's anxiety, and no medication can calm them down. 
Fingernails dig deeper into their skin, drawing blood and foreshadowing the film's finale. At the film's climax, the kidnapper approaches the protagonist with a double-edged razor blade and announces that even if she is freed, she will spend the rest of her life horribly disfigured. This leads to an argument between the two, the subtext of which alludes to themes such as nature of inner and outer beauty, the value of women in society, and the societal stigma against expressions of vulnerability. The argument on the surface, however, does not sound sophisticated or profound. There is no consolation for a fight having emotional depths. At the end of the day, the blows will always feel more physical than intellectual. Eventually, the kidnapper loses patience and grabs the protagonist by the shoulders and slams her to the floor. He reaches out his hands and grabs her by the face. The subject's attention is again pulled from the screen when they hear groaning from every direction. The wordless hums fill the theater with a sense of worry and uneasiness. So much so, that the subject feels the room getting smaller as the air polluted with angst grows thicker. As the subject brings their eyes back to the film, they see the kidnapper gripping the protagonist's lower lip between his thumb and forefinger, squeezing tight as to pop her lip like a balloon. The kidnapper then takes the razor blade to the victim's lips. He pauses to mock the protagonist, and while he does this, blinded by pride and arrogance, she jolts into action, grabbing the razor right out of his hands with her teeth. She follows up her burglary with assault. Her neck stabs forward, and in a blur, she stabs the kidnapper's eyes out. It happens in an instant. The kidnapper has no time to react. Blood spills from his face. Screams pour out of his mouth. During this time, the protagonist maneuvers the razor into her fingers. She hacks away at her bindings, but they are stubborn and resist her sawing. The battle continues, and the kidnapper is able to tear off the victim's lips entirely. She looks like a monster now. As the kidnapper smiles and celebrates his wrongdoings, the protagonist finishes freeing herself and slits the kidnapper's throat with the razor. The protagonist locates the exit and scrambles towards it as the kidnapper bleeds to death on the cold, hard floor. The protagonist then speaks her final words. Due to her injuries, her voice is muffled and raspy. She bears down and calmly speaks. One last time, she mocks the kidnapper, telling him that he cried tears of blood and therefore had to die according to his own rules. During this climax, it is reported that the subjects experience a sense of dread unique to any other terror ever felt. Strangely, the feeling appeared not to correspond to the scene in the film at all. It is a feeling entirely separate from the viewing experience, as if for a moment, the subject is taken out of the moment in time and transported to a realm composed only of fear and anxiety. But just as quickly as they left, they return. The Foundation sees it worth mentioning that this peculiar moment happens to occur during the film's most clearly recalled scene. While descriptions of violence vary from one viewer to the next, the climax is unshakable in its consistency. This is further evidence that SCP-5040 has a core foundation that remains intact. False memories are given validity by our peers. When we tell a story, the inaccuracies are often the best parts, the exaggerated drama, the rearranged sequence of events, the jokes you thought of in retrospect, but weaved into later accounts. While a storyteller knows when to lie, a good storyteller knows how to not get caught. SCP-5040 captivates its audience, but it seems to know how much it can get away with. By providing a consistent, objective truth, a climax that is reported the same across all accounts, SCP-5040 insists, even if only briefly, on being a credible film, not just a random sequence of 24 frames per second. Eyes back to the screen, the film abruptly cuts to an unspecified point in the future. Now wearing a face mask to hide her disfigured mouth, no different than the one seen worn in the theater, the protagonist walks down the street to her apartment, indifferent to the crowd of paparazzi that follows her. It is clear that this is now just a part of her life. The lights flash on her face. When she reaches her bedroom, the protagonist slowly pulls down her mask. Face free from cloth, she stares at herself in the mirror. It is silent. What she sees is less notable than what she doesn't. The lower portion of her face is gone. She focuses only on that. It's hard to know if she will ever see into her own eyes again. Her gaze might forever be fixed on what she can't get back. And through those eyes that long to see more, she sheds a single tear. Over the course of several minutes, her weeping gradually builds into frenzied sobs and shrieks. It can first be misinterpreted as bad acting, a case of doing too much. But as the crying carries onward, 
it's understood that the horror in her wallowing is all too real. The film cuts to black and the credits roll, but the sound of the protagonist's cries continue to play with no other audio until the credit reel ends, and even then, in silence, it's hard to say if she ever stopped crying. Audience members remain silent after the movie ends, exchanging only whispers as they exit the theater. Feet step over small red puddles and stains on the theater floor as if they are sticky puddles of soda. Those who remain past this point experience an escalating feeling of unwelcomeness until sitting and staying is more physically demanding than getting up and walking out. Some experiences will stay with you forever, even if they never actually happened. Rock, Paper, Scissors a simple hand game dating back to the Han Dynasty of Imperial China. It is a decisive game between two players, with the only outcomes being win, lose, or draw. We're quite familiar with rock, paper, scissors here at the SCP Foundation, as the guards are often seen playing intense rounds of the game to determine who will be the unlucky soul chosen to secure one of the various Keter class SCPs during a given week. In most cases, this use of rock, paper, scissors is accepted as a largely harmless and fair way for defensive personnel to arrange their shifts. The reason for this is that the results of rock, paper, scissors are generally random, as there are very few ways for an individual's skill to influence the game. Or so one might think. In reality, rock, paper, scissors is a deeply psychological game, and this is mainly because of its origin as a contest between fellow human beings. The average human is vulnerable to making errors and falling into patterns, and with only three options to keep track of, it is entirely possible for a seasoned veteran of rock, paper, scissors to predict their opponent's choice before any hands are thrown. Of course, that opponent may also commit an error of their own by misreading the other player's actions, and thus there is always a chance for an impulsive decision to swing the results of the game in either direction. Human limitation is the only skill-based mechanic in the game of rock, paper, scissors, and that same limitation is what, in the eyes of some, holds the game back from reaching its true potential. That was the case until someone out there discovered the rules to an anomalous version of rock, paper, scissors being spread through a mysterious email. While all attempts to trace the email back to its original sender have left the Foundation with more questions than answers, we have been able to learn more about the differences between the rules of standard rock, paper, scissors and the anomalous version. We have given this anomalous version of rock, paper, scissors the designation SCP-4633, and unlike the classic edition, under no circumstances are any Foundation personnel allowed to play a game incorporating any of the alternative rules. While the ceiling for skill and variety is theoretically much higher in a rock-paper-scissors match featuring SCP-4633, the risks to the player far outweigh any added novelty. Here is how SCP-4633 functions during an average game of rock-paper-scissors, well, average prior to the anomalous properties taking effect. Rather than being limited to using merely rock, paper, or scissors, as the name of the game implies, the players gain access to a series of additional hand gestures, which upon the act of being thrown become seamlessly integrated into both players' shared understanding of the rules. This alone would be bizarre enough, but the true harm caused by SCP-4633 is in the nature of the gestures themselves. When one of the non-standard gestures allowed by SCP-4633 is used, the player's hands will change shape in ways that, under normal circumstances, would be anatomically impossible. Each of these non-standard gestures is distinct from the rest, with the only commonality being an unusual tendency for the final gesture to resemble biological structures often seen in sea life. One particular gesture might cause a player to rapidly grow a ring of additional fingers surrounding a gaping anemone-like mouth in the palm, while another could result in the player's entire arm flattening into a fin-like appendage. Regardless of how severe a departure from a typical human limb the final gesture would be, the limbs, and on rare occasions the entire body, of the player using the gesture will quickly and irreversibly mutate into the shape required to successfully perform it. 
While these gestures overwhelmingly result in forms that would be distressing to most people, the same cognitive effect that causes the participants to accept changes to the rules also appears to apply to the changes affecting their own bodies. To the players of an SCP-4633 augmented match of rock-paper-scissors, the non-standard gestures seem as mundane as the original three. Unfortunately, the morphic properties of SCP-4633 are practically irreversible, with extreme reconstructive surgery being required in even the best of cases. In all instances of SCP-4633, surgical intervention is necessary to prevent the spread of details regarding the non-standard gestures and their usage. Because of the immediate shift in cognitive awareness among participants, all that is needed for a new instance of SCP-4633 to occur is the faintest hint of knowledge of the alternative rules. It's even been noted that between different groups of players, the non-standard gestures can vary heavily or seemingly be created on the fly as the desire to win at all costs takes hold. Here are a few examples of anomalous gestures which have been observed during instances of SCP-4633. This list is by no means comprehensive, but it will provide an insight into how SCP-4633 drastically alters the existing mechanics of the game, as well as the physique of the players. The Thoriley gesture transforms the user's fingers into barbed tentacles. It beats paper and scissors, but loses to rock. Chavoaga folds the fingers of the hand into the palm and causes them to emerge through the back of the palm. It allows the user to throw a second gesture after they've seen their opponent's choice. Ashkelhaz splits the hand into a pair of poisonous stingers, which also produce a potent electrical current between them. It has been seen to lose to paper, but seemingly of their own will, the stingers lashed at the opposing player and caused them to fall unconscious three rounds later due to the effects of the poison. Shausa beats paper and two other anomalous gestures, loses to scissors, rock, and a third gesture, and morphs the user's arm into a dactyl club similar to the front appendage of a mantis shrimp. Izurgov simply causes the player to grow three additional thumbs on one hand. The final gesture resembles a triple thumbs up. Izurgov has not been seen to beat any gestures, and the player who uses it always seems to go on to lose the match. Pagakmar causes the middle and ring to recede into the hand, while the pointer and pinky fingers extend to resemble the eye stalks of a snail or slug. The rest of the hand also becomes coated in a thin layer of slime which continues to secrete from within. Pagakmar beats scissors and paper, but loses to rock and another anomalous gesture known as Vyanjek. Incidentally, Vyanjek causes the arm of the player using it to elongate into a worm-like tube that periodically spews a gout of salt water on the opponent. When Vyanjek was seen beating Pagakmar, the salt water appeared to have some adverse effect on the latter gesture, causing the eye stalks to droop and the hand to shrivel until it was half its original size. Another anomalous gesture is Grazathrog, recognized by the skin, muscle, and veins of the hand turning translucent, revealing a pulsing red organ in the interior of the palm. Once Grazathrog has been thrown, the player who used it may call out the name of one other gesture, which can no longer be used in the current match. The Ukayag gesture is a bit deceptive, as it resembles rock when first thrown but gradually causes the hand to condense into a lump of inert material, not dissimilar to actual igneous rock. The knuckles as well begin to exude a superheated mineral substance similar to molten lava. Ukayag exclusively beats paper and appears to lose to everything else. Many of the gestures on record have no known name but their function within SCP-4633's altered rules is clear from the context in which they were used. Such is the case with one anomalous gesture, which caused most of the player's hand to withdraw into a siphon-like opening at their wrist before the very same orifice shot out a stream of ink into the opposing player's eyes. While there was no lasting harm done to the opponent by this gesture, the ink did cause temporary blindness, which persisted until they were defeated by way of their rock losing to paper. Another unknown gesture has been seen beating both Izurgav and Ukayag. This gesture makes the player's hand resemble the crest and gas-filled body of a Pacific man-o-war. 
These examples are only scraping the surface of the seemingly endless possibilities that SCP-4633 has to offer. As you can see, the anomalous hand gestures can be just as dangerous within the game itself as the permanent changes they invoke in the user. While the Foundation has done its best to contain all information surrounding SCP-4633, there have been clear efforts by several unknown groups to push the game into continued usage. Over the past three decades, instances of SCP-4633 have seen increasing popularity in the world of high-stakes gambling. Perhaps it is because of the inherent thrill of watching two opponents trying to strategically outwit each other with a countless number of non-standard gestures, but more likely, it is part of the anomalous effect of SCP-4633 that the game would appeal to those desperate to risk everything on the slim chance of victory. This neatly brings us to the SCP-4633 related incident which occurred aboard the private ocean liner known as the SS Fateful Emma. Before the incident, the Fateful Emma would sail into international waters twice a year. Each time it would bring along a new group of passengers, seemingly selected from the underprivileged and downcast sector of society. A great many of these passengers were convicts with repeat violent offenses chosen from supermax facilities the world over. The process by which these inmates were chosen for a voyage aboard the ship was not dissimilar from the methods the Foundation uses to acquire new Class D personnel. Naturally, this was how the research team was able to be tipped off about the fateful Emma. It became apparent soon after looking into the ship's career that the individuals altered by the effects of SCP-4633 had been seen departing from the ship on multiple occasions in remote island harbors. Most of the time, the individuals would also be, to the best of their ability with their metamorphized forms, carrying briefcases filled with hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. While witnesses tend to write off the strange appearances of those affected as being the result of a deformity or injury, or in more pronounced instances dismissing the encounters as sightings of creatures from the local mythology, it was clear to anyone familiar with SCP-4633 what was truly going on. These passengers were being made to play pitched games of rock-paper-scissors featuring SCP-4633 for massive sums of wealth, and what was worse, the grand prize winners were seemingly being released back into civilization without the knowledge of law enforcement. Of course, what the Foundation was most concerned about was the potential for the large-scale leak of detailed information involving SCP-4633. It seemed that the Foundation's latest faceless enemy had revealed itself. Whatever wealthy group of individuals was pulling the strings behind the games aboard the SS Fateful Emma, it was very likely that the ship was also well protected by a private army of trained mercenaries. In a display of swift but necessary initiative, the Foundation assembled a brand new mobile task force to be dispatched onto the ocean liner. Mobile Task Force Row 52, with the fitting code name Rochambeau. The mobile task force would board the vessel secretly and use whatever means necessary to prevent the spread of SCP-4633 and any evidence of the associated non-standard hand gestures. Before the fateful Emma's next voyage, the Foundation isolated the port where it would depart from and made sure that the MTF agents were in position. The operation was co-captained by Agent Dubois and Agent Zhang, both of whom prided themselves on having extraordinarily good luck. Agent Dubois would stealthily move the majority of the agents under his command into the cargo hold below deck and await Agent Zhang's signal. Agent Zhang himself would assume the name and identity of one of the criminal passengers, who was intercepted before boarding by the mobile task force. The would-be participant was subsequently detained and brought into the Foundation as a Class D personnel. As the SS Fateful Emma began to leave the harbor, Agent Zhang joined the other passengers who had been gathered together in an enormous function hall. There was little indication of when the games would begin, and Zhang made an effort to keep a low profile until more information was available. Shortly after the ship had officially arrived in international waters, an eccentric man entered the room on a walkway that overlooked the rest of the passengers. He was flanked by a pair of armed bodyguards. It was plain from the man's style of dress and demeanor that he was both absurdly wealthy and completely out of his mind. He wore a pure white tuxedo and a scarf that seemed to have been made from the fur of a Siberian tiger. A pair of dark shades with sequin rims obscured his eyes from view, but by far the strangest aspect of the rich man was the fact that emerging from the wrist of his right arm was the eyeless head of a moray eel where his hand should be. The man spoke, addressing the entire room. 
Welcome passengers new and old to the SS Fateful Emma. While you're aboard this ship, your fate is in your own hands. Over the next 24 hours, you will have the rare opportunity to play the greatest game of chance that humanity has ever known. Generations of people from every continent and every walk of life have given their all to the mastery of rock, paper, scissors, across, nos, la, chor, slash, sis. The man proceeded to speak unusual syllables for the next minute straight without even a pause for breath. In his report, Agent Zhang described the man's voice as gaining an increasingly loud hum as his speech continued, and that some of the syllables didn't seem to be the product of human vocal cords. He soon concluded his string of gibberish and resumed speaking intelligible language. As is customary, we will be utilizing the Iljesh Toei rules. You will begin by selecting a single opponent and challenging them to a best of two of three match. This is a single elimination tournament, and any competitors who cannot otherwise continue to engage in matches will also be eliminated. By the end of your time here, the luckiest among you will be named the undisputed champion of these games and will be granted unlimited freedom along with the cash prize. The rest of you will have to determine your own fates, for you all know what awaits you below. May your hands be ready, your minds be sharp, and remember, winning is everything. With a flourish of his moray eel hand, the wealthy man finished his introductions and promptly exited the room. Agent Zhang looked at the passengers surrounding him and saw that they were already beginning to play rock, paper, scissors with each other. A few had already begun using the anomalous gestures, warping their limbs into hideous subnautical shapes. Agent Zhang gave the signal to Agent Dubois and the rest of the mobile task force to begin the operation. Their target was primarily the moray-handed man, as well as any other close associates that he had on board. They would capture him alive and interrogate him into revealing the mystery behind this illegal gambling ring. Once the mercenaries were dealt with, Agent Dubois' team would further command the ocean liner and navigate it to SCP Foundation Research Site 45 to await further orders. As for Agent Zhang, he knew what he had to do. To buy time, he would participate in the ensuing Rock, Paper, Scissors tournament and eliminate as many of the other players as possible. This, he believed, was the best way to minimize the number of anomalous gestures that would be used aboard the ship. Of course, he himself wouldn't be using any of the anomalous gestures either, opting to limit himself to the standard three. This could put him at a severe disadvantage over the course of the competition, but Agent Zhang knew better than to tempt fate. Still, being eliminated seemed like something he may want to avoid. Even though the consequences for elimination were left vague in the strange rich man's speech, he still didn't feel that it would be wise to put himself in a compromised position while aboard the fateful Emma. Bracing himself for the worst, Agent Zhang accepted the challenge of a nearby passenger. He was off to a promising start when he threw a scissors hand against his opponent's paper. Because the matches were best two out of three, all he needed was to win one of the next two matches, and he'd survive this round. Then he saw the devious look on his opponent's face, and he knew that this match was about to get weird. Rather than admit defeat, Agent Zhang prepared to throw scissors again. The two challenged their hands, and just as Zhang had feared, his opponent threw an anomalous gesture. Almost instantly, the opponent's hand took on a multi-mouthed piscine form, which began to spit sharp teeth in Agent Zhang's direction. Fortunately, the agent's bulletproof vest was able to withstand the impact of the teeth. What was even more fortunate was the fact that the opponent seemed to be a good sport. Scissors beats as Ravak, you win, said the other passenger before walking away in search of their next match. Curiously, the passenger's transformed arm continued to fire teeth across the room at random intervals, occasionally hitting and causing injury to one of the other competitors. Agent Zhang was grateful that the body armor he was wearing had been tested to withstand rapid fire from SCP-127. Compared to the raw power of the living gun, the teeth launched from Azravok gestures were practically BB rounds. He had succeeded in not being eliminated, both from the game and generally. Excited about his win, Zhang sought out another opponent to test his luck. Below deck, Agent Dubois and the rest of the mobile task force had just finished facing off against some of the hired mercenaries when they entered a room presumed to be the ocean liner's sick bay. Inside was a grisly sight. A second rock-paper-scissors tournament playing out between players that had been so thoroughly transformed by the anomalous gestures of SCP-4633 that they barely appeared to still be human. It was like a scene from a deep-sea documentary 
with strange and unknowable creatures vying for dominance, not within a natural food chain or competition for resources, but within a seemingly never-ending struggle to win a game of chance. It was purgatory. Rock, paper, scissors, purgatory. Agent Dubois was appalled, but he knew better than to attempt to stop these creatures from doing the one thing keeping them all distracted. The moray-handed man was still somewhere in the ship, and capturing him was far more important. The research team would decide what to do with these former humans once the ship was secure within the Foundation's custody. However, what Agent Dubois didn't realize is that some of these creatures were advancing on his team. In nightmarish and unearthly voices, they chanted, Rock, rock, paper, scissors. Suddenly, one of the abominations, who resembled nothing more closely than an enormous mass of coral, produced four arms from within its body and began to throw anomalous hand signs towards the agents. One of the arms threw Ukyag, which coated an unsuspecting agent in hot lava, causing him to drop to the floor in pain. Panic Dubois ordered the task force to eliminate every living thing in the sickbay, although not in the sense of their tournament standing, of course. Meanwhile, Agent Zhang was on a win streak in the function hall. Through sheer luck and determination, he had managed to avoid elimination while eliminating several other passengers himself. He began to notice that those who were eliminated were quietly escorted away by the bouncers, seeming to have their anomalous changes treated. Now it was only down to 12 remaining passengers. Agent Zheng knew that it was only a matter of time before Dubois and his team took control of the ship, but feeling reckless, he challenged one of the remaining passengers. In that moment, something came over him, as if his determination to see the mission through was also compelling him to win at any cost. His opponent threw Pagakmar, and out of instinct, Zhang threw Vanyanjek. The agent went on to win the entire tournament, but sadly, he was unable to collect the prize money, as during the skirmish below deck, the man with the moray hand had escaped with a small fortune in a high-speed submersible. His ultimate goals and the scope of the shadowy group he represented would remain unanswered for the time being. When the SS fateful Emma finally arrived at Site 45, Agent Zhang came to his senses and realized that he had underestimated the cognitive side effects of SCP-4633. Due to the immediately recognizable anomalous state of both his arms, Agent Zhang was later contained on site with minimal security. It's believed that researchers are still searching for a method to reverse the effects. It just goes to show that winning isn't everything. Ask anyone that has been through it, and they'll all tell you the same. That moving home is maybe one of the most stressful things that a normal person can ever experience. It's a logistical nightmare right from the start. The moment you talk to a realtor about being interested in selling your current house and buying another, everything goes downhill from there. After that moment, an avalanche of things comes hurtling towards you. Finding a place you like, making an offer, letting people look around your house, waiting for them to make a counteroffer, exchanging contracts, and that's before you even have thought about packing. And as Milo had learned, doing all of that on your own only makes the stress of moving feel all the more potent. But he had finally made it. After a constant back and forth with his realtor, the time had come for him to pack up all of his worldly possessions and relocate to a brand new place to call home. He had felt it was long overdue for him to get a change of scenery, and luckily, just the right place had come onto the market to answer that call. It was a pretty big house, bigger than Milo's previous home, but considerably cheaper. In fact, he thought it had been significantly undervalued. The house had an almost Victorian-era feel to it, all beautifully carved and varnished woodwork and creaky old floorboards, but in more of an elegant, refined sort of way, rather than a creepier one. That's not to say Milo's new place wasn't without its more unsettling elements. Aside from being big, spacious, and easy to imagine as being haunted, the creepiest thing about the house, aside from its frighteningly low price, was the story of what happened to the previous owners. Obviously, you know that legally we have to disclose whether or not anyone died on this property, the realtor had explained, wearing a forced grin as she showed Milo around the house. Hearing that sentence, he could feel the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Someone died here? He asked in disbelief. No, 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 of course not, sir. The realtor instantly walked back her statement, less in an effort to ease her client's nerves, but more to ensure that she still closed the deal and earned her commission bonus. And why the hell would you start a sentence like that? 
Milo asked. We just have to give full disclosure, but I assure you, the previous residents didn't die on the grounds of this house. She gave that fake smile again. It was pretty ineffectual at reassuring him. So, what happened to the last owner? Well, it's a bit of a mystery, to be honest. A local legend, if you like. But hey, that gives the place more flavor, hearing some spooky history, right? Think of what a conversation starter that will be. The realtor ended her sentence with a forced snorting laugh, but reined it back in when she realized Milo wasn't laughing with her. Ah, as far as I know, there used to be an older couple living here, the Shaws. They were apparently very quiet, reclusive, kept to themselves a lot, I'm sure you know the type. Milo couldn't help but notice she shot him a look as she said that part, as if she was silently passing judgment on the fact he was planning on moving in alone. But they used to spend a lot of time tending the garden out front, so their neighbors would see them pretty frequently, which meant they were all okay and no one had any bad mishaps in the house. You know how old folks can be, such a worry when they get to that age. Yeah, totally. Milo interjected, aware the realtor was stalling. He repeated, So, what actually happened to them? Well, that's the thing, she shrugged. Nobody knows the full story. One day, the neighbors across the street noticed they hadn't seen Mr. and Mrs. Shaw for quite a while, so naturally they came on over here to see if they were in, and the last thing they wanted was to assume everything was hunky-dory here. I mean, hey, better safe than sorry, right? But once they got inside, they couldn't find either of them. Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were just gone, vanished without a trace. Most people on the street thought they had just sold the place, kept it quiet and moved away, retired to somewhere nice and exotic. Oh, well, that sounds nice, I suppose. Milo replied, relieved to hear that there hadn't been any brutal unsolved murders in the house, and that it most likely wasn't haunted. That's just what the neighbors think anyway, the realtor continued. Of course, they hadn't sold the house, they just left it. When my firm came in to repossess the place, it had all their belongings in it. Some might even still be laying around here. Uh, anyway, did you want to have a look at that contract? Well, strictly speaking, Milo was the only human living in his new house. He was never fully alone. He had arrived with his two closest friends, a pair of pets he had adopted while living in his old house. One was a hamster by the name of Donut, named after his round little body, and the golden brown shade of his fur had reminded Milo of the glazed sugary baked treat. The other was Pixel, a bearded dragon with a pattern on his scales that resembled some kind of mosaic art. The first order of business, Milo had decided, was before even unpacking. He needed to make sure his scaly and furry friends each had a suitable place to stay and that he got them fed. Little did he realize there was something else living in the house with them. Something that was far bigger and was getting much hungrier than either of his pets would. Looking around the house, Milo stumbled across a few boxes that he hadn't brought with him. Like the realtor had said, the Shaw still had some of their possessions left lying around the place. Most of it was useless to Milo. Old man's clothes or a set of knitting needles and rolls of colorful thread, it was those particular clues that seemed to imply Mrs. Shaw had a lot of free time on her hands and maybe took up knitting as a hobby during retirement. Of course, the bigger clue was the huge handmade blanket that Milo found draped over some of the remaining boxes in the attic. He wasn't exactly well versed in knitwear, but he could appreciate the craft behind this soft blanket. It clearly had a lot of time and effort put into making it, painstakingly knitting each and every individual thread, looping it around a pair of steel needles and eventually, after hours of wearing out shaking, bony fingers, produce something that actually looked quite nice. Even though the idea of sitting and knitting a blanket might have been one of the most boring uses of time Milo could imagine, he still had to admit he was surprised that the Shaws had left this particular piece of bedding behind. It seemed like it would be pretty comfy to sleep under, and might help keep a person warm at night now that the colder seasons were approaching. What's more was that the blanket was clean, almost like it had been freshly washed. There was no old person smell on it, no dirt or discoloration, not a stain and it hadn't even accumulated any dust in its fibers. In fact, he noticed that there was hardly any dust at all up in the attic, despite the house being empty for so long. He assumed the realtors had hired someone as a caretaker while they found a buyer for the place, and they had kept the place clean. After all, what other conclusion could they have possibly drawn? It's not as if something had eaten all the dust. 
That would be absurd. He'd have a sort through of the Shaw's leftovers later, maybe sell some of it off at a local yard sale or give it to a thrift store. But that blanket might come in handy when it started snowing, so Milo had half a mind to keep it. Now, part of what makes moving home such a stressful life experience isn't just all the logistical and administrative parts of the process. It's only made worse by the fact that it takes forever to move into a new house fully. That's the part everyone always forgets about. The months after a move, when you're forced to live amongst towers of cardboard boxes, all your worldly possessions buried deep within them, and you can never remember which crate anything is in when you urgently need it. So realizing it would take him much longer to unpack all of his things, Milo set about making sure he had everything that Donut and Pixel would need already to hand. The latter of his two pets, the Bearded Dragon, usually spent most of his days in a spacious glass tank. Milo didn't love the idea of keeping either of his two best buds so confined, but Pixel never went very far anyway, content to lay under a heat lamp almost perfectly still for most of the day. Donut, on the other hand, was much more of a free spirit. The tiny brown hamster physically could not stay still, and most days seemed to be filled with more energy than Milo was. As a result, he let the little guy roll about inside a little plastic ball all day long, until his little hamster feet gave out. And now, Donut had much more space to zip around inside his ball, so while he entertained himself, Milo could focus on what needed fixing, cleaning, and generally improving around the house. It didn't take him long to realize, however, that the realtors had pulled a bit of a fast one on him. Despite the absolute steal of a price that Milo had been offered, it quickly became clear that the unknown fate of the previous residence wasn't the only detail about the house that had been conveniently kept hidden. The place was in dire need of repair, with a lot of the old woodwork rapidly rotting away. If left unchecked, parts of the house could collapse and come apart at the seams. To make matters worse, the boiler was an ancient iron monstrosity that was barely able to produce warm water, which would quickly become an even bigger problem when the weather started to get colder. Then, to top off the trifecta of unforeseen issues and teething problems with his new place, Milo couldn't sleep. It was to be expected. After all, the house was old, worn out, and had definitely seen better days. There were bound to be a few noises, the odd creak coming from upstairs when Milo and his two pets were all downstairs, the tapping of branches against windows blowing in the wind outside. But for some reason, every audible disturbance that emanated from some hidden corner of the building only seemed to get a thousand times louder when the sun went down. At nighttime, every squeaky floorboard or random noise of the house settling was nearly deafening, enough to pull Milo right out of what little restless sleep he was getting. The worst part about it was, though he couldn't help it, it made him feel unwelcome as if Mr. and Mrs. Shaw were angered that he had moved in. In the dark, it was hard not to picture every sound as one or both of the old couple creeping through the corridors, coming to reclaim their home and remove Milo from the premises. One night, the noises started invading what little sleep Milo did manage to get, spilling into his dream and causing them to devolve into unsettling nightmares. There was an old photograph in a frame that he had come across in the personal effects left behind by the Shaws, showing the pair of them staring disapprovingly out of the image at him. Now, thanks to the creaking wooden structure of the house and the sounds it made at night, Milo was seeing the old couple in every bad dream he had. Both their faces were locked in those same still, frozen expressions of contempt as they tried to exercise him like an interloper on their property. That was the final nail in the coffin that made Milo realize he needed to look at other options. Surely there had to be some way to induce a deep enough sleep so that the sounds the house was making weren't keeping him up or incepting nightmares anymore. He called the local doctor, arranging a consultation for later that day. As he hung up the phone, something nudged against his foot. It was Donut, having rolled through the maze of cardboard boxes still filling the house. Milo took one look at the little brown furred hamster than the crates that still littered the place. Grabbing the leftover items that the Shads had forgotten to take with them before they vanished, Milo moved those boxes out into the shed. He knew he was probably reaching, that it was hard likely to make even the slightest difference to his sleeping, but maybe keeping their stuff away from him would keep the old couple out of his head. The only thing he kept in the house was the blanket. There was no use letting it go to waste, especially knowing that the boiler was on the blink and it would be cold soon. He rolled it up and left it on his bed, leaving his more mobile pet in the same room, 
before heading out to see the doctor. When Milo got back, a bottle of prescription sleeping pills in his pocket, he couldn't help but notice his room seemed different. The blanket looked like it had fallen off the bed and onto the floor for one. But more worryingly, Donut's plastic travel ball had been split open, laying in pieces on the ground, with its furry little occupant nowhere to be seen. Over the next few hours, Milo searched every corner of the house, calling out to his hamster, trying to lure it back with more morsels of food. But Donut didn't seem to be anywhere. He wasn't even underneath the knitted blanket. Still, there was no sign. As worry set in, Milo hurriedly checked Pixel's cage to see if he was gone too, but the lizard was relaxing, as lethargic as ever, completely unfazed by what was going on. It certainly seemed that when it rained, it really poured in this new house. Just as he was searching for his missing hamster, Milo heard a new, horrible sound echo through the corridors. This one wasn't so much a scary noise, even if it did make him jump, but it was more the inconvenience that came with it. Finally, giving out after God knows how many years it had been installed for, the house's boiler burst. Spending the afternoon into the evening failing to track down one of his missing pets and stopping the huge iron cast boiler from flooding the basement wasn't exactly what Milo had in mind for fun activities to do when he got home. Going to bed frustrated made it as hard to sleep as all the nightly cacophony of creaking floorboards and branches raking against the windows. He tapped out two of the pills the doctor had prescribed him, knocking them back with a sharp motion of his head and a swig of cold water before laying back in bed. As night had fallen, the temperature also had plummeted too. Not having a boiler to heat his room meant that Milo couldn't stop himself from shivering in the cold, his breath forming clouds in front of his face. He reached for the knitted blanket and threw it over himself, curling up underneath it to try and provide an extra layer of warmth to protect himself from the gnawing cold. The pills did as they were meant to, helping Milo to quickly sleep into a much deeper sleep than he had experienced in a while. Although it didn't seem to help the nightmares, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw came back again. This time they had Milo's arms and legs tied up. With their matching disapproving faces, the elderly couple threw something over their helpless victim and tried to smother him to death. For a dream, it felt so intense, so real. Milo could feel a heavy weight on top of his body as he slept. In fact, it felt like it was all around him, engulfing and crushing the life out of him from all sides. But it was the feeling of something wet against his arm, the sensation of liquid against his skin, and the numbness where his hands should be were what finally pulled him out of the dream and into the nightmare. Through the dark and his cloudy vision, Milo could see a wide, gaping maw filled with teeth. The feeling of being crushed was still surrounding him, and despite kicking his legs and trying to free himself from confinement, it didn't stop squeezing him tighter. His panic was already making it harder to catch his breath, but now he could barely fill his lungs enough to scream for help. Not that anyone was around to hear him, but it was the sight of his arm that chilled Milo's blood. It wasn't there anymore. Part of it just above the elbow was just gone. His hand, fingers, every internal bone and muscle had been reduced to a bloody mess, a slurry of red melting and coming apart. It was runny, little more than a liquid resembling the consistency of sand when it's underwater and becomes sludge. Most of his flesh was liquefied, going further up his arm, and as the blanket pulled its prey into its mouth until Milo was no more, not a trace of him left, just like the previous owners. Little did Milo or the Shaws and Donut before him know, but he'd been the victim of a creature that was part of a rather unique species. While they will often vary in size, shape, pattern, and other aspects of their appearance, SCP-799 always seem to be ordinary items of knitted bedwear, at least at first. They retain heat like a normal blanket would, and are soft to the touch, and for the most part, don't seem directly harmful. And usually, they aren't. SCP-799s are incapable of much movement, instead laying still a lot of time, not unlike a certain bearded dragon that just lost its owner. They also don't seem to require much in the way of food, extracting what little nutrition they do need by drawing in household dust. A lot of the organic matter and dust is comprised of dead and discarded human hair and skin cells, so this makes sense. This feeding is all done through filtered mouths in the fibers. However, this changes if an SCP-799 blanket is forced to go on a long time without food. While they possess this biological trait themselves, SCP-799 don't seem to regard cold-blooded animals to be the source of food. 
In fact, they don't even seem to be able to detect other creatures with cold blood, such as reptiles. Instead, SCP-799 will metamorphose into a more predatory form in order to consume any warm-blooded mammal or human being it encounters, transforming its feeding orifices and digestive tract into a singular mouth lined with several rolls of sharp, pointed teeth. From there, it will wrap up the largest warm-blooded animal it can find, whether that be a hamster or a grown man, and will tear off parts of its prey, reducing them to little more than a thin slurry as it digests their body mass to feed itself. So if you move into a new house and come across an old knitted blanket, maybe consider throwing it out, if you want to live. Welcome back, dear viewers of SCP Explained. We hope you've been keeping well, and we also hope that your health insurance covers blown minds. Because today, we're using our trademark Anomatron 6000 to pit an anomalous legend against another Marvel legend. That's right, it's SCP-682 versus Dr. Michael Morbius of the 2022 cinematic masterpiece, Morbius. Of course, there is one issue that we should share with you before we begin. We haven't actually seen Morbius, however, here's the wonderful thing, statistically, you haven't either. In fact, we tried to get the Anomatron 6000 to process Morbius as raw data for the simulation, but our antivirus software kept stopping it. Intriguing. So instead, we simply hit randomized traits on the Anomatron, so its free-to-use advanced AI could conceive what Morbius is like and what his abilities probably are. And as far as you or I know, it might even be correct. So let's get this show on the road and see if the hard to destroy reptile could hone against its own at cinema's most tragically memed upon superhero. Prepare for perhaps the most absurd and ridiculous video, with the exception of the Among Us video, that we've ever released on here. In other words, it's Morbin time. It began as many bizarre SCP Foundation stories do, with SCP-682 cracking the glass of its acid tank and preparing to spill chaos and terror onto Site-19. For most people, even seeing actual footage of this would be a life-defining traumatic incident. For most seasoned Foundation researchers, it was just another Sunday. When 682 busted through the nearest wall like a psychopathic reptilian Kool-Aid man, while guards engaged in the futile task of trying to subdue it with small arms fire, the senior researchers languidly made their way to the nearest secure panic room and hunkered down. As was standard protocol for SCP-682 escapes, all available mobile task force units would be dispatched, single-mindedly focused on cutting the lizard back down to size. But the problem was, this wasn't just any other Sunday. It was Super Bowl Sunday. And seeing as most mobile task force operatives are incredibly tough and manly, they generally love football and promised they'd definitely come and take down 682 as soon as the game was over. This would be one thing if SCP-682 was content to just terrorize the usual denizens of Site-19 today, but no. It'd been a while since the hard-to-destroy reptile had tasted civilian flesh, and he intended to rectify that toot sweet. In a state of murderous fury, 682 barged through wall after wall with the effort that a normal human might walk through rice paper. Soon enough, it was free from the drab gray walls of the containment site and feeling the sun on its scales once more. Such a lovely day out, with the distant sound of people laughing and chatting and children playing happily with their pets. 682 predictably found this disgusting and resolved to destroy them all. And with all those mobile task force operatives swigging beer, eating peanuts, and giggling at amusing celebrity cameos in Super Bowl <laughs> halftime ads, there would be nobody who would stop 682 from completing its dastardly task. Except, of course, one man, Dr. Michael Morbius. While 682 was escaping, Morbius was sitting on the deck of his private yacht, drinking a martini glass full of 2% milk because Morbius understands the importance of having healthy bones. He was listening to a fantastic podcast about the curative powers of beef jerky when high above the SCP Foundation activated the Morb signal, a Batman-esque light shining up in the sky in the shape of a clown. This was bad. Morbius paused his podcast and prepared himself, finishing the last of his milk and washing out the glass so it didn't get smelly. He raised his arm and summoned the Morb Orb, a glowing red ball that seemed to be the source of his powers, according to a number of internet memes. He clutched the orb, feeling its power flow through him as he made a small prayer to his guardian deity, the late David Bowie. And with that, he took flight 
twin jets of fire blasting out of his shoes like rocket ships. He could only hope that he'd be able to intercept SCP-682 before it was too late. Meanwhile, SCP-682 was indulging in one of his favorite hobbies, just killing lots of people. He'd invaded the American city of San Fran Angeles, New York, which was known for being the biggest population of people within the proximity of Site-19. 682 was truly rampaging. He knocked the ice cream cones out of children's hands, causing them to weep profusely. He literally kicked dogs, and he also murdered a number of adults with his vicious fangs and claws. The local police attempted to stop him, but they were hopelessly outmatched. They attempted to cuff the monster several times, only to find out that by the time they were halfway through trying to read the beast its Miranda rights, it would break free and rampage yet again. All in all, 682 was having a grand old time, and was delighted that nobody was coming to stop its rampage of utter devastation. It seemed almost as though the rampage would never end, until a dark shadow fell over the ravenous reptilian monster. It turned up its head to see a new foe floating above it. Was it a bird? Was it a plane? No, it was Dr. Michael Morbius, of course, wielding his trademark flaming trident of justice. Another lamb to the slaughter. 682 growled, Are you ready to meet your end? Morbius laughed and shook his head. I don't know who you are, you scaly monster, but for hurting all these innocent people, you're about to get morbed on! And with that, he threw his flaming trident at the reptile, striking brave and true. But it wasn't enough. 682 had developed incredibly strong reflexes after years of the Foundation's attempts on its life, so Morbius would need to try a lot harder than just using his classic beloved trident to end this fight. Even then, before Morbius had a chance to think up another method of attack, 682 had adapted and switched to the offense. Two great dragon-like leathery wings unfurled on the monster's back, and it took to the air, lunging towards Morbius with fangs born and claws at the ready. Before Morbius knew it, the creature's jaws were ready to close around his head. Thankfully at this moment, another one of Morbius's classic superpowers comes into play, his short-range teleportation abilities. In a moment of reflex that would impress 682, Morbius teleported out of the monster's path, remanifesting instantly floating a few feet away. 682 growled in irritation. Of course it would never be so easy, it said. The Foundation always sends one of its freaks to distract me. You may think you're strong, but really, you're just another puppet. I've never heard of this Foundation, Morbius quipped back, and I'm not your standard hero either. I really blur the line between hero and villain entirely. In fact, before Morbius could finish explaining what a complex character he was, if you could even use that word, 682 flew after him again. This time, however, Morbius was ready. He lifted up his arms and unleashed another one of his patented attacks, opening up human mouths in the palms of his hands, which unleashed miniature yet still extremely powerful air-to-air -air missiles. The missiles blasted out and struck 682, causing an impressive explosion. But 682 was well-versed in explosions. He kept flying after Morbius. He needed to get out of here fast, or he'd become a lizard's lunch. Morbius turned and flew in the opposite direction, the hard-to-destroy reptile hot on his heels. The first step, of course, would be to get away from populated areas to limit collateral damage. No matter what happened, Morbius refused to let this mysterious entity harm more people. You cannot run forever, 682 growled. Your wretched life will be brought to a slow and painful end, stranger. They were passing over the water now, flying at quantum speeds, watching the Pacific Ocean whiz past beneath them. That's when Morbius noticed it and had an epiphany, a volcano, and by the looks of the smoke rising above it, an active one too. Morbius had a plan now, but to execute it, he'd need perfect speed and timing. He stopped in midair as the beast flew towards him, but moments before 682 could make contact, Morbius grabbed it, executing a perfect mid-air suplex, and tossed the roaring beast directly down into the volcano below. For any other monster, this would be the end of it. But for 682, a double, triple, or even quadruple tap was often required to reliably incapacitate it. Morbius's work was not done. He flew down towards the volcano, ready to engage in the next hectic <laughs> stage of battle. Bet you're not feeling so cocky now, you nasty reptile! Morbius yelled, 
but the reptile in question was too busy flailing around in impossibly hot magma to reply at the time. Such is the way when falling into an active volcano. SCP-682, burnt and charred, but still alive, began to crawl from the top of the volcano, wheezing out smoke and ash. How could such a strange, confusing creature have been such a formidable opponent? No matter. It will destroy this Morbius. It might just take a little longer than expected. Little did the unfortunate reptile know, Morbius was preparing his next weapon, perfect for immobilizing this ornery monster. An eight ball in a gym sock, forming a kind of dangerous makeshift flail. It was the kind of lethal improvised weapon that would strike fear into even the strongest of enemy combatants. And now SCP-682 would learn to fear its power. As the flame-broiled reptile began to stand, perhaps preparing to adapt to its latest set of injuries, Morbius began relentlessly beating the hard-to-destroy reptile with the 8-ball sock, dazing it with repeated brutal strikes that never seemed to stop. Morbius had learned this technique from years of being involved in vicious bar fights, normally caused by him cheating at darts. This can stop any time you want! Morbius yelled, you just need to stop getting back up! Initially, 682 wanted to remain defiant, but even it could not deny that being struck again and again by the 8-ball sock was actually extremely painful. Was it really worth the fight? After performing some quick mental calculations, SCP-682 determined that, no, it probably wasn't. Time to throw in the towel. Okay, okay, 682 said, mostly just annoyed at this point. Or stop rampaging. Honestly, you just took all the fun out of it. 682 just sighed and laid on the ground, exhausted, slowly regenerating from its injuries. Morbius smiled, content with his victory. Who knows how many people he'd saved by luring this creature away from a population center. By this point, the Super Bowl was over, and the legions of mobile task force operatives, who technically should have done this hours ago, finally decided to suit up and take care of business. It didn't take long for black tactical helicopters full of Foundation soldiers to triangulate the location of the volcano where the end of 682 and Morbius's epic battle had taken place. It wasn't long after that that there were copious Foundation boots on the ground. This story, of course, has a happy ending. Mobile Task Force agents successfully recaptured SCP-682 and returned it to its containment cell in Site-19. And in the process of recovery, they mistook Dr. Michael Morbius for the actor Jared Leto, and shot him roughly 30 times in the chest with armor-piercing rounds, killing him instantly. Want an anomaly of your own? Check out www.scpswag.com for high-quality SCP merch. Now go and check out SCP-096 vs. Siren Head, and SCP-076 Able vs. Chainsaw Man, who has the most lethal weapon for more wild vs. battles.